to go through all of that. Point of parliamentary procedure. Gentleman will state his. If point. the gentleman from Indiana and the other members of the committee vote for my request that the governor be invited to this hearing, we could get his views directly on the record. That's not a. That's not a proper parliamentary inquiry. We will stand in recess for 45 minutes. <laughs> Representative Sununu, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this morning we heard a line of questioning by the minority that I think established uh, a, a few somewhat insightful points. Uh, they established that gambling is a business, that like any business, it involves competing interests. Uh, they established that there are well-intentioned people supporting these endeavors and very many well-intending people opposing them, and many members of this committee that have serious questions about the, uh, the moral and social implications of gambling on a local community. Well, these may be uh, interesting points, but the fact is uh, that it's not news, uh, nor is it really pertinent to what we uh, need to be talking about here today, because what we need to be talking about is the process, uh, the process that's supposed to be fair and open uh, in making decisions uh, through the gaming legislation and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and ensure that that process, one, is not circumvented uh, by White House staff, that uh, uh, these decision, lines of decision making, are not influenced by political contributions to the Democrat National Committee, and that uh, false and misleading testimony is simply not allowed to be made uh, before Congress. Those are the issues at hand, is whether or not there was improper activity in the decision making process. Now, in focusing on the process, I want to highlight three uh, pieces of, of law, legislation, and, and formal agreement. One is the compact that's been mentioned, uh, a, a, legal, a legally binding document between the state and, uh, and the chairman and the various tribes uh, that I believe fully the governor has every intention of abiding by. Second, we have the strong recommendation at the local level uh, from the Interior Department in support uh, of this application. And third, obviously, we have the rights of the individuals uh, to hear the concerns uh, that might be put forward by the Interior Department to address those concerns uh, and to provide uh, cures to these, uh, to these defects. And I think that as we look at each of these three parts of the process, we find some very serious questions about what transpired. Let me focus on the, the second uh, for just a moment, and that is the, the very strong recommendation that came from the local level. Um, I think it was uh, Chairman Ackerley, you mentioned the FONSI, the uh, finding of no significant impact. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, uh, exactly what that meant? What we were told was there was uh, environmental concerns had to be updated and addressed from the conversion for uh, the, the dog track uh, compared to the casino. Uh, in other words, there's, there's different rules and regulations that the tribal interests have to be protected and upheld. And the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs suggested that we we update that and, and have our environmental people go through the process and the property and make sure there's no uh, contaminants in the, uh, in the property that we're acquiring to be put in trust. And you did so early in the process? Yes. Is that what led to the finding, uh, I, uh, September 14th, 1994, uh, coming out of the Ashland office in Wisconsin, I have a quote here, it has been determined that the proposed action will not have a significant impact on the quality of human or the, or the natural environment, and the preparation of an environmental impact statement will not be necessary. You're familiar with that finding? Yes. Uh, did anyone at any time subsequent to that ever request that you prepare an environmental impact study? Not that I'm aware of, no. Was there any indication that there were strong environmental concerns at any time between that date and the ultimate rejection on, uh, on August 14th, 1995? No correspondence to you that, that this might be an issue? No. In the rejection letter, however, wasn't there some mention that there were perhaps concerns about the environmental impact? Yes. 
any reason in your mind that they might have included that um, at, in the letter after all of the findings that there would be no impact? Not clearly, no. Were you given any opportunity to address defects between uh, the original approval from the area office, which was on November 15th, 1994, and the final rejection letter? No, that's what concerned me and confused me from about the uh, bureaucratic process of not following the presidential directive of consulting with the tribes. Uh, Chairman uh, Gosh Bagosh, on, um, <coughs> in April of, uh, of 1995, uh, Pat O'Connor, lobbyist for the opposition, met with Mr. Don Fowler, chairman of the DNC, with the opponents uh, of, of, this, uh, of this project uh, over at the DNC. What do you think? What do you think they talked about in that meeting at the DNC? I can only speculate on that, uh, on, uh, you know, on that question. But I assume, as uh, uh, if I can use this example, that uh, uh, that with myself, if someone came to me and said, uh, "Mr. Chairman, we have a problem here with this matter," and that happens numerous occasions in tribal politics. Uh, and I'm a busy person. I tell someone, you take care of this matter for me and look into this matter and, uh, and, uh, and get back to me. And I assume that's the process that was uh, occurring. Given that it was a Democrat National Committee, the fundraising organization, do you think they talked about raising money through political contributions? Yes, in my opinion, that's, that, that's why they put money into uh, to uh, be able to have access to the movers and shakers. You certainly weren't made aware of that meeting, were you? No, I wasn't. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Kinjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, this uh, original deal did not involve your three tribes. It involved another tribe originally, and that fell apart, and they withdrew from the operation, and then your three tribes got involved. What period of time did that originally occur? When was the first contact made with your three tribes? Uh, Congressman, I was the last tribe uh, talked to about the, uh, the venture, and I'm, I don't know exactly when they contacted the, uh, the Coup de Ray tribe. I think they were first and then Red Cliff. And do you know what approximate date that was? I. I want to say in the latter part of 93, when I was first contacted. Right. Now, uh, at, at that point, d d were you asked to uh, put any funds into this uh, venture, or were you, just, were you just told that we need you to participate in this venture in order to pursue this application for the off-site uh, gambling location? I was informed that the, the governor's proposal for the tribes to form the group would, uh, would, would, would show a favorable light on his approval of the, uh, the, uh, the casino uh, from the dog track venture. So you were, you were told by someone that it was Governor Thompson's desire that the three uh, tribes get together and form this joint venture with uh, Mr. Havenick. Right, because it would be a reduction of, uh, of uh, existing sites on reservation. And, and do you recall who told you that? I, I, I want to say the other tribal leaders that we had a meeting with, and um, I think it was Chair Lady uh, Grinnell, along with Chairman uh, Molson from Lac de Flambeau, I think. So it would, would it be fair to say that it was your understanding this was a done deal if the three of got together and formed four feathers, the application was going to get the support of the state, the governor, and was going to move through and accomplish? Uh, it, their directive was to get federal approval first. But that if you got federal approval, the governor would approve? Yes. Okay. And, and so that we've heard some statements made by the governor, letters written and everything, and that is not representative in your opinion of what you were led to believe would be the governor's position? Well, I've known the governor for a long time and it's always a play on words. There is no expansion if there's a reduction. Mm -hmm. And we're talking off reservation. 
If the federal approval would happen, the land would be held in trust for the benefit of the tribe. It would no longer be in public feed. Simple well, land, it would be trust land, and the casino could be a good uh, go ahead with that. Okay. Do, do you have any other casinos that the three tribes are involved in, or is this the only investment? Uh, no, just uh, our own casinos. Do, do, do any of the others, do you have any? Le Couture just has, has one, one site, and that's on reservation. And is that involved, Mr. Havenick or his group at all? No, not at all. But is it completely Indian run, or is it? Yes. We have no management company uh, running our operation. What, why did you think in this instance, then, you should make a deal with an outside management company? If you have some experience in running a gaming operation, why couldn't you have just put the three tribes together and made the application to expand your casino operations on this uh, dog track? First of all, I want to just clarify, uh, Mr. Havenick and Crowland Properties is not a management company. Uh, it's currently a Class three operation. The facility is, is there as a Class three operation, and it was basically an, op an opportunity for us without the resources to invest 20 to $40 million to, uh, to construct a new uh, casino site with a seven-year compact window that we had with the state. But for that opportunity, he was going to benefit to the extent of 25 to 30 percent of the profits. If, if, in fact, you're putting this venture together, you're going to be responsible for it. If you're financing it, what's the benefit of having this, third, this fourth party involved? We're, we're all going to benefit. There was, based on the studies by Arthur Anderson. The, the, I understand. The three of you clearly are going to benefit, and clearly Mr. Havernick is going to benefit. But if you already have a gambling casino, and you now want to extend it outside of that limit in a new site, why couldn't just the three of you have gotten together and put that package together if you had an indication that the governor is going to be supportive? We don't have those resources, the financial resources, to, to do that, Mr. Congressman. Well, uh, I, that's understandable. Did you reach out to see whether you could get those financial resources? Oh, you should see after we signed our compact, we had people uh, 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 approaching us constantly to uh, provide an operation, and we're very diligent. Uh, we don't want to have uh, people with questionable backgrounds okay. be affiliated with people okay. with, uh, with well, questionable well, backgrounds. And I understand that. And someone here said that they felt Mr. Havnick was their friend. Is, he, that, is that correct? One, yes, Mr. Know? Havanak is our friend. Okay. Uh, well, he, are you aware of the fact that? Okay, are you aware of the fact that uh, the uh, uh, Indian uh, Gaming, uh, National Indian Gaming Commission, felt that the uh, terms of this agreement were not acceptable under the regulations and under the law? They never responded to the coup d'etat that way. Uh, so, no. so, so you're not aware of the fact that your contract did not comport with the standards set by the Department of Interior and by the regulatory uh, bureau that, that succeeded what would be acceptable in a contract. None of you are aware of that? Is the first time you're aware of that, that I'm telling you that? We, Mr. Congressman, it, it never got to that point. We, we were never given the opportunity to get to that step in this process. We followed the procedures and the steps that we needed to and never got to that process. The other thing is, is it, has been to, it has you know, been reviewed by the commission, the commission. We had not gotten into that, that so you, discussion you did, with them. You did not. The other thing that is thing. that concurrence from the uh, governor was never given the opportunity because we never got to that step in the process. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, since uh, the other member who wants to ask questions is not yet here, would you put up on the screen uh, the facts as... Uh, I'd like for all my... Mr. Chairman, is this the second round, just so we know the no, allocation of time? No, I have not time? had a round yet. Uh, this is my first Okay, time. fine. Uh, I think we need to not lose sight of the facts of this, this, this case as I see it. First of all, the law requires, the law requires consultation with tribes that are applying for a license for a casino. The law and the Interior Department's policies clearly state that local opposition cannot kill an application. There has to be real, concrete detriments. The law also says that if the Department believes there are problems with an application, they must, they don't have any latitude, they must consult with the applicant tribes. Now, in this case, they did not consult with the applicant tribes. What happened was the rich tribes who were making $400,000 per person, every man, woman, and child, hired a very powerful lobbyist, Mr. O'Connor. And Mr. O'Connor and others, including the tribal leaders of the rich tribes, did meet 
with the Department of Interior officials. The tribes in question, even though the law required that they be consulted, were not consulted. But the tribes that had a vested interest in keeping them from getting their license were consulted because Mr. O'Connor, by my reading, had access to the president, the vice president, and a lot of other people at the DNC. And because of that, he arranged this meeting, or they arranged this meeting, and the tribal leaders did meet with the people at the Department of Interior. Now, $350,000 at least was given by the rich tribes after this application was turned down, even though this application had moved up the food chain. As soon as uh, this was completed, two very top officials at the Department of Interior, the counsel to Mr. Babbitt and his chief of staff, Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, left the Interior Department to work for the rich tribes. Has nothing to do with whether or not you're for gambling. The fact of the matter is, they arranged this meeting, the, the, the lobbyists did, the rich tribes were there, the ones who were supposed to be included were not included, weren't even informed about it. And then uh, $350,000 were given, which appears to be a political payoff. And then after that, Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier, two top ex executives at Interior, go to work for the rich tribe. And then after that, Mr. Collier carries a fifty dollars to $100,000 check to the DNC from the Shacklebees. Now, I don't know how anybody, even if they're blind, could not see these facts. Now, whether or not you're for gambling is irrelevant as far as this is concerned. What we're talking about is whether or not the law was not complied with, number one, whether or not campaign contributions were used to exert influence on people in the White House and at the Department of the Interior to kill this, uh, this project. And I think it's pretty clear, at least from my perspective, it's pretty clear that uh, that's, the, that's, uh, that's what happened. And uh, we intend to try to make that case as we get further along into our hearings uh, today and later on. And I thought that we should lay that out very clearly because the questioning kind of muddies up the waters as we go through it. And so I want to take my five minutes to lay that out as I see it. And with that, uh, I'll yield uh, Mr. Cox. Would you like the rest of my time? I yield to Mr. Cox the remainder of my time. Uh, I thank the chairman and I'd like to thank our witnesses and uh, thank my colleagues uh, for their attention to this matter. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the question of whether or not your application ought to have been approved is uh, an important one, divisive one, and one that is uh, frankly of uh, no interest to this committee in its oversight role just now uh, because uh, we are instead charged with uh, looking at violations of law uh, in connection with political fundraising uh, and money and gifts and so on to government officials uh, in the 1996 and prior uh, election cycles. The New York Times, uh, among many other papers, has outlined uh, some of the facts in connection with this matter, which have led uh, most people to predict that an independent counsel will be required to investigate whether or not the Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, uh, in fact uh, lied under oath when he testified last year before the United States Senate. The subject of that testimony, the subject of the potential uh, independent counsel investigation, the subject of the Justice Department investigation thus far, is not whether or not there should have been a casino gambling or a dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin, but rather whether the third of a million dollars that was contributed in the process was given uh, to the Democratic National Committee and to the election effort of President Clinton was on the level. Uh, whether or not uh, the President's involvement in this, and the President, as you understand, was involved, uh, was uh, ordinary and normal. Uh, whether or not uh, Bruce Lindsay's involvement was ordinary and normal, whether or not uh, Harold Ickey's involvement was ordinary and normal. Uh, and so uh, while I understand that none of you 
worked at the Democratic National Committee. None of you worked in the White House. Uh, I want to ask each of you, now under oath, whether or not uh, you know, either uh, personally or uh, as a result of uh, uh, information that's come to your attention in the course of this, whether or not you know uh, anything at all about uh, the involvement of the President or Bruce Lindsay, who worked for the President in the White House, or Harold Ickes, who worked for the President in the White House, or uh, Chairman Fowler at the Democratic National Committee. Does any of you know anything uh, uh, that would lead you to believe that those people were involved in the decision in this matter? And I start. Uh, I, I thank the chairman, uh, and I'd start with uh, Chairman Goshkabash. I have no personal knowledge of that, Mr. Congressman. However, in discovery, uh, what the attorneys have found, they found internal memorandums uh, and uh, perhaps a phone uh, call made from Air Force One uh, to the White House and also a, a, a personal memo that was drafted by the President um, I, I don't have that here at, uh, at my disposal, but I believe that there was a, a memo by the president uh, inquiring about uh, what's happening with these Indian tribes, uh, something of that nature. And that's the only knowledge that I have of that. And uh, do you have any knowledge with respect to the others that I mentioned, either Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Ickes, or Mr. Fowler? Uh, no, I don't. Mr. Ackley. Yeah, Mr. Congressman, I have to echo the same sentiment. I, I, I don't have any personal knowledge of all those things that occurred. No. Uh, do you have any knowledge of any kind? That is to say, has somebody told you of these things? Uh, uh, no, I, I try to find out things on my own by going to uh, Loretta Avant and following the procedures and going back to the Department of Interior. And, uh, finally having a meeting with Duffy. And as a tribal leader, uh, not having any meetings with the secretary, I still feel slighted by that somewhat. I think uh, as, a, as a secretary of the department, he needs to meet the elected leadership of the nation of all the uh, tribes and throughout the country. I think that's uh, something he, sh he should be uh, doing at all times. Uh, and Chairman Nuago, and I should have referred to you as Chairman Ackley. I apologize. Thank you. We'll forgive you. Um, I don't have any personal knowledge of, of uh, these meetings that took place, other than the fact that the, the record speaks for itself with regard to the litigation that we have going on. Um, it's well documented that uh, uh, there are certain things that took place. Uh, as I said, I don't have the personal knowledge, but, but it is on the record with regard to deposi depositions and uh, other documentations of memos and such that these meetings did occur. The New York Times on January 11th in its recounting of the events that led to this decision states that a pivotal day in the process was May 17, 1995. On that morning, Chippewa seeking casino approval met with interior officials. Uh, and those interior officials, according to the New York Times, never raised any concerns about the applic application. Uh, afterward, Mr. Eckstein, who also attended the meeting, told his clients that he thought an interior approval was almost assured. Uh, what's your understanding of what happened uh, on May 17, 1995, at that stage in the process? <coughs> and I'd just go in the same order that I did before, starting with Chairman Goshkabash. Again, I have no no uh, recollection of that or any or any knowledge on that, perhaps because Arlen Ackley, uh, 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 Chairman Ackley at that time was basically the point person uh, for the partnership, along with some of his people, uh, staff that was working on this project. Chairman Ackley. Yeah, I was trying to coordinate the information, and and I know the conversations we had with the uh, the people in Interior and Gaming. Um, when they asked me about uh, clearing up the, uh, the parking lot uh, for the land and trust issue, and so we weren't landlocked, that gave me an indication that uh, the process was going forward and uh, they were going to approve the application. Why else would they talk about uh, putting land and trust on behalf of the tribes? So uh, 
my personal thought was that you're indicating that you're going to approve it. And that's where I left it. Chairman Nuago? Just checking. Um, on May 17th, I participated in that, in that meeting with uh, John Duffy. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, I, I don't even know who exactly was all in that meeting. I do know that um, I became rather frustrated because of the, the types of conversation and the flow of the conversation that we were receiving from the department people. And um, I could only relate a childhood experience at that time that, that, that uh, I shared with John Duffy and uh, shortly after that, we uh, we left the meeting. But I, I I don't recall the specific content of the meeting, but I know I did become very frustrated. As a result of uh, not knowing up until that pivotal stage in the process that there was in fact a problem with the application, uh, is it your sense that uh, you were? essentially denied an opportunity to remedy any defect in the application? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we weren't notified uh, at, at this point. We were assuming that everything was on track and that uh, we were expecting a decision any day that would be favorable. If there was a problem, then we, we assumed that we'd be notified of that problem so that we could work on uh, making the corrections and providing additional information. That didn't occur. And at any time after that stage, were you apprised of the problem so that you could remedy defects? No. Chairman Ackley? The only problem I could see was Duffy standing in the way of us getting to the secretary. And that, like I said, my, my personal feelings is that still concerns me that uh, the secretary didn't want to meet with us and they were giving me indications that there was something else in play, that uh, Duffy was talking on his behalf, and that uh, what Chairman Nawago refers to, getting frustrated, we were all frustrated because we didn't know if our message was getting to the secretary or not. And as tribal leaders, we were demanding an audience with the secretary, not with Mr. Duffy. And that's the frustration that we had at that time. Chairman Nuago? I was unaware of uh, any any problems. As I stated a few times earlier, that we were, we were preparing to open a casino. That was our belief. We went as far as having a, a job fair in Hudson, Wisconsin. We had continual meetings. We've had, We've had floor plans drawn up. We were in the process of uh, opening a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin, and that was our belief. But I see that my time has expired, and I thank the chairman. Uh, we are about to conclude with this first panel. Uh, I believe uh, you'd like one more five minutes to... If I could. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, this has been very enlightening for me and, and actually very helpful um, because, frankly, my view of this, reading through the file was that it was in many ways a, a moot argument because to me at least it seems so clear that Governor Thompson was going to reject this um, that it didn't make any difference what what the feds did um, and as all of us know it's a two-step process under IGRA the first step is for the Department of Interior to make a decision and then the governor has the final say um, that's why as I've read several times now, I thought that the governor's position was clear, um, that he was opposed to the expansion of gambling. And, and that, to me, as I read this letter and, and watched the tape, although I have a question about the tape, um, was that, that there was nothing that could happen. Now, from what you're saying, you're saying that the governor's position wasn't that clear. Is that, is that right? What's, what's going on here? Because I think that you would agree with me that if you were the department of, if you were Secretary Babbitt and you read this letter, my position continues to be clear, I do not support an expansion of Indian gambling in Wisconsin, that's, that seems like a pretty clear statement. Um, and that when the governor is opposed to it, that's, that's the end of the discussion. What's, what's going on under the surface here that makes, that made you optimistic that you were gonna get this, notwithstanding the governor's public comments? Congressman Barrett, <clears throat> The political reality today is there's 30,000 Indians in Wisconsin. And you as an elected official realize that with 30,000 voters out there, 
the governor's not going to play to the Indian constituents. He's going to play to the major constituents in Milwaukee and Madison and large metropolitan areas in Wisconsin. And he's saying, what you've seen on this video was, was a debate during, during, during the last term of office that he ran for. And so any time the governor is going to be confronted with that, of course he's going to deny that there's no, the, that there's no further expansion of gaming. And if you look at Hudson, that's not a further ex expansion of gaming. It's currently a class three facility. Okay, but, but again, it, he was talking about in this letter, Indian gaming off reservation. Again, thank you for your recent letter regarding the expansion of Indian gaming to off reservation sites in Wisconsin. So even the statement that you could have closed a, a reservation site in order to open this seems to be foreclosed by this letter. But my question, and I agree with you, I agree with you that, that politically, and that was the point I was trying to make in, in my first round, that the, the majority of the people of the state of Wisconsin have stated their opposition. But, but you also stated that, that you're not a naive man, or words to that, that effect, and that you would not have been spending the time and effort that you did unless you had reason to believe, reason to be optimistic. I'm asking you that in, in, in light of these, what seem to me to be unequivocal statements from the governor, there must have been some reason that you thought there's something going on here. And I'm, I'm asking you, what the, did you have conversations with the governor or the governor's staff? I had, <clears throat> I, I met with the governor on several occasions in confidence. And <clears throat> the governor's indication to me was, yes, you're absolutely correct. It had to go through the, through the hurdles that it had to go through. And when it reached that point, if it was approved by the feds, meeting the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Interior, that he would not stand in the way. So you're saying that this letter then is false? I'm, say, I'm not saying that the letter is false. I'm saying that the governor has been very wishy-washy on this issue all along. But let me just say this. We would not have to close down a, a reservation site because in our compact, we have the opportunity for two sites. Right, but I... I when I read this letter, I thought, okay, maybe what's going on here is if he, if he was trying to be clever is to say an expansion of gambling, there would not be an expansion of gambling if one site was closed and another one was open. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Um, and, and obviously you're saying that that's not even the case. That's not the case. Okay. Congressman, the, the, the governor was aware that we, we made application for the conversion of the dog track into a casino. Once the... Our, the land is put into trust status, then the, the Indian casino can go ahead. Mm -hmm. But it needs the concurrence of the governor to uh, object to that or not. But would you, let, let me ask you this question. If, if you were the Department of Interior and you had this letter that I've read from several times, what would you conclude the governor's position to be? That he doesn't want any expansion of gaming. Mr. Gash, Gash? And if you read the press, I think you're going to get a whole different picture because just as the chairman put on the screen, the governor at one time said you know, he's in favor of this. In fact, it was the governor that, that, that pushed this, this proposal on us okay. because the Coup d'Array wanted one, one, to open a, an additional site early on in Bayfield County. And the governor said, I'll never, I'll never support that unless there's two or three tribes question. in one a consortium question, to do this. Because my time is running out. One final question. Much has been said about, about the meeting with the Department of Interior um, between Dep Department of Interior officials and members of other tribes, or representatives of other tribes. Did you have any meetings with the governor or the governor's people without opponents of Indian gaming being present? Well, it's tough to get an audience with the governor, myself, and the governor not returning phone calls to me, I assume the governor, if I'm going to meet with the governor, it's his privilege and right to meet whoever he wants to. And when okay, I met with fine. the governor, I was the only one I'm president. Not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to impugn your integrity or anything. I'm just, I, I just want to make the point that, yes, yes, they met with some people. On some, it's, it's not unusual that you're not going to meet Perhaps with the, he did. the different faction at the same time. Unbeknownst to me. I understand. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, if I may respond to sure. some of this question. Yeah, I may respond. Um, I, I guess getting back to the, to the point is that we never got to the point where we were going to ask the governor whether he concurred or not. The, the, the application took a quick downslide, and, and we never got to that. Mm -hmm. But his, his letter is dated June 9th, so it's 
Definitely. You know, but we never we never got to, to, to that point of, of whether the governor was going to concur with it or not. Okay. I think my time has expired. Thank Gentlemen's you, Mr. Time Chairman. time has expired. Unless uh, members uh, wish to continue questioning, I think we're through with the panel. Did you want to make one? Chairman. Uh, Representative Cummins. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, take a moment to um, thank you, gentlemen, for being here this uh, morning. Uh, in my district, uh, I represent a lot of poor people. And I certainly can understand your efforts to try to lift their lives up. I, I really do. Uh, I am, I've always been against gambling, but I understand what you're trying to do. I also want to compliment um, our friends here from Hudson. The mere fact that you've taken your own money to come down here today, taken up time to be with us, to provide whatever you could in the way of testimony, we really do appreciate it, and I thank you on behalf of all of us for being here. Around this Congress, I might tell you that we, we hear a lot about family values. And I've always believed that if we're going to have family values, we must value families. That is so important. And I think that as listening to uh, some summaries a little bit earlier about who you are and the fact that you want your community to stay the wonderful community that it apparently is, we certainly understand that. And we also value the fact that you value a wonderful family life. And so we thank you for being here. Just have one question for our witnesses is that, you know, when you have wonderful people like, like the group here from Hudson, um, and I, I know you must have known, and based upon a number of the things that Mr. Barrett has asked, you must have known that you, you're going to have stiff opposition to this. Um, and, and, I, and I'm just wondering if, it, if this wasn't a surprise to you, was it? Hello, somebody speak up. Not to me, it wasn't. The opposition, you weren't surprised at it at all, were you? No. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to see you there and to see them here and the fact that, you know, nobody subpoenaed them, I don't think. They came here because they care. And so I would imagine that when you have people that care that much to come here to Washington, from Wisconsin and take a day or two off from work and to pay that airplane fare or however they came, that's very, very significant. And so um, I can understand why uh, perhaps uh, Governor Thompson uh, stated the things that he said in the letter that uh, my, my uh, colleague, uh, Congressman Barrett, talked about. And I can certainly understand uh, why uh, this uh, proposal went down the tubes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield to uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Cummings, and to my colleagues. The uh, concerns that were here today, as addressed by the chairman at the beginning of this uh, committee meeting, had to do with whether or not there was any, essentially, uh, plausibility for the rejection by the Department of the Interior of the uh, application, or if, in fact, the decision was made as a result of uh, sharper political considerations. Um, I think that as we consider that those issues and debate in this committee, uh, there's a few things that, are, that can be said without uh, coming to any conclusions. And that is, first of all, when you have uh, representatives here from, uh, of Indian tribes who have described the conditions which exist on those reservations, um, we have to do something in this country to make sure that people uh, are able to survive without resorting to casino gambling as a possible way of, of uh, sustaining their economic livelihood. We have to do more for American Indians across this country, and I want that acknowledged here today in this, uh, in this forum. Uh, furthermore, uh, the concerns that the Department of Interior had to address uh, whether or not there were political motivations behind them. There had to be something plausible, first of all, that there was community concerns and objections. Hudson apparently made a very strong case why there shouldn't be a casino in their area. Now, I'm a former city councilman and a former mayor of a city, and I understand what it means when people in a neighborhood really don't want something in their community or anywhere near. So I can understand why they would be very strong in their objections to a casino um, uh, in or any kind of gambling in their area. That should not be taken personally by the members of the Indian tribe, because I'm sure they would object to that it was sponsored by anyone. 
However, the fact that it's coming from a group that is economically disadvantaged to begin with uh, certainly raises concerns for your plight. Uh, furthermore, I think that when we look at whether or not the Interior Department made the right decision, we have to see if there's any plausibility in their rejection. And if they have the concerns of the contract that was laid out, which you so ably uh, would contest, or the concerns of the community as part of their uh, rejection, I think we have to give that some credibility. And then we're going to listen later to evidence as to whether or not it's been political. But I, uh, I certainly want to uh, congratulate you on bringing forward the plight of, uh, of, of Indians. Uh, for many years, I've, in Cleveland, we have an active movement. I'm familiar with uh, Dennis Banks and Russell Means and others from 25 years ago when they were stating the concerns about economic viability. So while this hearing will pass away at some point, your concerns have to continue to be articulated and you didn't get the, uh, uh, the gambling outlet you were seeking, but you sure better get some economic assistance in that area, and I support you in that. Mr. Chairman, if I may respond. The gentleman may respond. Uh, we're about to wrap this up, so go ahead. Okay. Um, it's very difficult for me to um, sit here and, and, and hear about objection. When I sit in northern Wisconsin, and look at the situation in Connecticut and the, for the most part, the entire state op opposed and objected the annexation that the Pequots presented. And the Department of Interior approved that. And it's in litigation yet, I believe. So, so for objection, it's difficult for me to understand that. The other point I wanna make is that um, the trust responsibility and obligation that this agency has is to me, Native American. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. And, and, and the Congressman Cummings is talking about opposition. As a man of color, we understand opposition. My children understand opposition. I can remember when we were in the, in the middle of uh, our treaties and the battle we had in Wisconsin, young Indian women at a basketball game were being ridiculed and picked on because of the color of their skin. We understand opposition, and we understand the rippling effect that takes place. When we talk about morality in this, in this community of Hudson, I've got cousins that live in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Every Sunday afternoon, they drive to Hudson, Wisconsin, and they drive over there because they can buy beer over there. That's what they do. Every Sunday, that bridge is full of Minnesota plates going across there. So, you know, we talk about moral issues. We've dealt with the opposition. We followed the procedures that this Congress has put before us and that agency, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, and there's something that's not right with the picture. And we talk about family, we talk about all the good things. When something's not right with the picture, and I don't wanna be involved with this debate with the Republicans and the Democrats on who did what, because you're probably right, maybe on the other side there's something over there. I don't want to be a part of that. What I want to know is if we want to get to the truth, let's get to the truth. Now, I got a bunch of documents that I continue to look at here that tell me that something's not right with the picture. And it's frustrating for me because I certainly would like to see someone stand up and say, hey, let's take a look at this. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, I, uh, early on I was going to be afforded a few closing remarks, if I could, please. <coughs> Okay, real quickly. Okay, thank you. I too, as Chairman Narago, I want to just state emphatically, I'm not here to get into a, a partisan fight. I'm here to tell the, the, the story on behalf of my people at Le Couture as a tribal leader. I fought for both the uh, Democrats and Republicans and the one independent that serves on this committee as a, as a Marine Sergeant in Vietnam. And my battle here today is on behalf of our people. Statistics have proven in Sawyer County, where I reside, where my reservation is, that there was a, the, the, uh, our friends from Hudson stated that there's more crime where there's gaming. There's crime throughout this country. I'm afraid to come to this nation's capital because of the crime. But I just want to point out that we found out the opposite is true. When you provide opportunities for all people, for jobs, there's less crime in the communities because people are working. And I too feel strongly on the moral grounds that, that the Minnesota is a, is a dry state on Sundays and people travel back and forth from Minnesota into Wisconsin. And I don't see uh, uh, 
a, a great outpouring to uh, stop that alcohol flow and the carnage on the highways that we see today with drunk drivers. In conclusion, I just want to remind you that I feel it ironic that a mid-level official within the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Michael Anderson, would make a monumental decision on behalf of the Department of Interior when that's clearly the Secretary's position to make that. And in closing, I'd like to invite you out to Lacoudere on a fact-finding mission and throughout Indian country and see for yourself the economic hardships that our people face today. And I just want to say that Mr. Havanick and his family are very honorable people, and I want to thank them for their support in this project. And I feel strongly that, that, this, that we put a lot of work and effort into this, and we're not some dumb Indians that are sitting out in Indian country being taken advantage of. You. 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 Let me just end up by saying that uh, the Interior <laughs> Committee uh, and Mr. Richard Pombo and Don Young, who are the chair, Don Young's the chairman and Mr. Pombo is the chairman of the subcommittee, will be looking into some of the problems that you've alluded to today. I've talked to Mr. Pombo about this uh, last week, so I'm sure that he uh, will be looking into some of the other aspects of the problems <coughs> that you face. And with that, I want to thank you all very much for being with us today. I think you acquitted yourself very well. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank I you. thank you with all due respect to all the members of the uh, of the committee. Miigwech. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Mr. Fred Havanick. And Mr. Havanick, if you'd come forward at this time. Mr. Havanick, would you remain standing so you can be sworn in, please? to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got I do. Be seated. I now uh, recognize the uh, committee's chief counsel, Mr. Richard Bennett, for uh, 30 minutes. I... Pardon me, Mr. Havnick, do you have an opening statement? Well, I've been sitting here for like all morning and hoping that I would get my opportunity. Well, then you, you get, uh, I, you get a five-minute opening please, statement, sir. and if it's longer than that, you can submit that for the record. Thank you. Chairman Burton and distinguished members of this committee. My name is Fred Havanick and I reside in Miami, Florida. Along with other members of my family, I am engaged in a variety of business activities in Florida and other parts of the country, including ownerships of dog tracks in Florida, Texas, and Wisconsin. I would like to give you a short overview of how we got here today. <clears throat> in 1987, the voters of Wisconsin endorsed the establishment of gambling in their state by popular vote. Our company, along with numerous others, submitted proposals to open dog tracks there, and in 1989, we were granted a license for such a facility in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is just outside Minneapolis-St. Paul. One of the requirements for licensure was approval to build the track by the local city council, which we had received the previous year. It took more than two years from the time of licensure to the opening of the facility. Among the reasons for this long period of time was that we were required to build a new interchange on Interstate 94 and a four-lane highway to the track site. We also had to construct a major earthen berm and to comply with various other state-required environmental safeguards. Virtually the same month we opened in 1980, uh, 1991, Indian casinos began operating near us in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. A federal judge had ruled earlier that year that when the lottery had passed in Wisconsin, all games of chance were permitted. From that very first day, the track lost money. It quickly became clear that we could not compete with Indian casinos. At the same time, some Indian tribes found that they themselves were competing on an uneven playing field. Those with reservations in remote areas of the state were not generating meaningful revenues at their casinos, while tribes lucky enough to be located near big cities were getting very rich. By early in 1992, it became apparent to both us and some of the Indians that we both had what the other needed. Each had one half of the molecule. We had one of the only five class three gaming facilities located on a prime site near a heavily populated area and they had a product that was much more attractive to the public than ours. All business deals are marriages of convenience. In 1992, we were approached by the St. Croix Chippewa to turn the dog track into an Indian casino. 
As part of that effort, a plebiscite was held on a snowy day in December 1992 in which the voters of Hudson endorsed our proposal by a simple majority. However, our partnership attempts with the St. Croix fell through and we began working with other Chippewa tribes located in far northern Wisconsin. This arrangement was finalized in the fall of 1993. This business arrangement, negotiated jointly by our attorneys and attorneys for the three tribes, was quite simple. We would turn the track over to the tribes once an application to place the land in trust was approved by the federal and state governments, but would continue to be the sole guarantor of the mortgage. A management company consisting of the three tribes and myself would be formed to operate the casino and split the profits four equal ways. The existing debt on the track about $40 million would be paid by the partnership. In addition, that same partnership would own and operate the parking lot, through, though this land would not be put in trust. The parking lot would also be used as security for the mortgage on the track. Our partnership was unique in many respects. First, the land going into trust had already been approved by and was operating as a Class Three gaming location in Wisconsin. It has continued to do this to the present time. Second, the compacts, as previously described, had envisioned and permitted off-reservation gaming. Third, this was a fair and equal four-way partnership between three Indian tribes and a non-Indian company. Each of the partners had rep two representatives on what would be a board of directors. From the beginning, the tribes would have six of the eight votes. A simple majority governed the operations. Management responsibility was, was divided equally, not dominated by the non-Indian group. Since the dog track and most of the other facilities were already built, financing was already in place. Any and all guarantees would be solely our responsibility. There was never to be any liability on the part of the tribes. It is important to stress that while we had financial responsibility for the casino building and the parking lot, all decisions on management would be controlled by the tribes. They would have three-fourths of the votes on all matters. We would not profit in any way from the transfer of the building to the tribes. We would only receive one-fourth of the profits from the operating casino. It took over one year for the partnership agreement to be written. Numerous meetings were held between us and our lawyers and the tribes and their lawyers. In late 1993, the tribes began the application process to place the land in trust. At that time, we recognized that taking the land off the tax rolls could be detrimental to the interests of the city and other governments. We entered into negotiations with the city, county, and school board to develop a payment for services contract based on needs that were calculated by the local governments themselves. This agreement was finalized and overwhelmingly ratified by all parties in the spring of 1994. This included the City of Hudson, St. Croix County, and the Hudson School Board. The remainder of the story has been well documented. The tribes received unqualified approvals for the casino application from the BIA offices in Wisconsin and Minneapolis, and their approvals were sent to Washington late in 1994. While we were told the confirmation process there would take about 30 days, we heard nothing for months. We now know that soon after the Minneapolis office approval was announced, an intense lobbying and propaganda campaign began against us. We finally learned that lobbyists from opposing tribes intervened and delayed the process. Delay was expensive for all of us concerned. For my business, delay meant continuing to pour millions of dollars into the track in Hudson so it could keep operating. For the tribes, delay meant the continuation of life in poverty for thousands of tribal members. In late April, we engaged the services of Paul Eckstein, whom we knew to have access to Secretary Babbitt. Paul's job was not to sell the casino project, but to find out what we could do to get the application back on track. As we again found out later, there was nothing he or anyone else could do. Two incidents that took place following the turndown of the application perhaps tells the story best. The first was on August 15, 1995, just a month after the rejection. I was at a fundraising event in Florida where I ran into Terry McAuliffe, chairman of the Finance Committee for the President's re-election campaign. 
After the meeting, I went to say hello to Terry. I've known Terry for quite some time, mostly through his political activities. At the same time, Terry approached me with a large smile on his face and said, what's doing in doggydom? I said that we were having an enormous problem with an Indian gaming project in northern Wisconsin. He said, oh, I know all about that, to which I responded, come into my office, a private corner of the meeting room. I recall that Terry said, I took care of that problem for you. I was baffled and asked him what he meant. I recall that he said, I got Delaware North's Indian Casino project killed, the one that would have competed with you. I set up the meeting with Fowlers and others and turned it around. I told Terry that was my project and I was the one who owns the track in Hudson. His face dropped. He was clearly in shock and said little else. The second incident took place on December 3rd, 1996 at the reservation of one of our partners. The uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Havnick, can I interrupt you? What was the date of that conversation? August 15th, 1995. Thank you. The second, uh, uh, the second incident took place on December 3rd, 1996 at the reservation of one of our partners, the Lakota Ray in Wisconsin. There was a meeting attended by all three partners, myself, and officials of the BIA, including George Scabine. During the meeting there, during the meeting, there was much complaining about the turndown of the Hudson Casino application. Finally, Mr. Scabine said, look, don't blame me. We would have given it to you. It was the political people who turned it down. I am the main reason we are all sitting here today discussing the Hudson Casino. I was the one who absorbed Mr. Eckstein's costs that led to Mr. Babbitt's damning statements. And, and after the re rejection, I funded the lawsuits that uncovered the evidence of political improprieties in the decision. I believe I was the factor never considered by Heather Sibison when she told the White House in a moment of callous hubris that they were going to turn the tribes down without much explanation without much explanation. I believe that is a direct quote. I believe the department never thought that they would have to explain their actions because after all, this was just a bunch of poor Indians who would never be able to fight back. They could have a major project turned down without much explanation because no one would ever come forward and ask for one. But these tribes had a partner who had much to lose as well as to gain and who fortunately for them had the resources and the will needed to tear at the fabric of the department's cover story and to continue the fight. A grievous wrong had occurred. These tribes had spent years putting this agreement together. They successfully negotiated in good faith with the local community. They obtained a favorable recommendation from the local and regional BIA offices. We all played by the rules. The Secretary of the Interior violated his fiduciary responsibilities to these tribes when he claims that he blindly accepted the City of Hudson's 11th hour change of direction without requiring any explanation or attempting to resolve any identifiable problem with the project. These tribes and their 10,000 members were simply sold out. The Secretary of the Interior decided to protect the gaming monopolies of extremely rich tribes. Unlike the tribal members, I am a businessman with other ventures to rely upon. But even to me, the downturn of Hudson has been devastating. If at the end of the day, this project fa fails, I can go on to other matters. I do have other resources. My partners, however, have no other matters to go on to. They are poor and they will remain poor. They have one chance for their day in the sun and that chance is in Hudson, Wisconsin. Before I take your questions, I want to set the record uh, straight on the claims that there is thunderous local opposition to this project. This project and property historically was a farm in rural St. Croix County. There's a picture of the track in the parking lot to my right. It was only annexed into the city of Hudson to obtain city sewer and water services. St. Croix County is by far the largest local governmental unit that took an official position on this project. The county has a population of 54,500, contains over 900 square miles, 
and is governed by a 31-member County Board of Supervisors representing all areas of the county, including the City of Hudson and the Town of Troy. The City of Hudson has a population of 7,000, the Town of Troy a population of 3,000. Counties in Wisconsin have significant governmental responsibilities, including law enforcement, the courts, health services, social services, welfare service, protective service, mental health service, and highway maintenance. The St. Croix County Board of Supervisors overwhelmingly supported our proposal in 1994, and despite intense 11th hour lobbying, they affirmatively refused to back the Hudson City Council's last minute four to two vote, reversing the city's position. The county's position is not surprising. Outside of the city of Hudson and the town of Troy, there is a substantial desire for economic development and good paying jobs. Not everyone is as rich as the people who live in Hudson. This project would create over 2,000 jobs for St. Croix County residents. In addition, the dog track has been the catalyst for a number of new local businesses, such as Walmart, Kmart, a Fairfield Inn, and a Menards Home Improvement Center. Everyone understood that this project would produce significant new business and employment opportunities. That's why the broader local community of St. Croix County never changed its position that the project would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Mr. Havnick, uh, thank you very much for your testimony. I'm next going to recognize the Senior Investigative Counsel, James Wilson, for 30 minutes. Before I do so, I would like to uh, ask you to go over as plainly as possible one element of your testimony. In preparing for this hearing, I have reviewed scores of government documents and a mountain of press clips, and I have not heard before from any source uh, what you have recounted, the explicit statements made by Terry McAuliffe, which you told me were made on August 15th, 1995. Could you tell me uh, as plainly as possible what happened and what he said? Yes. <clears throat> I was at, the, at a, fun, a fundraiser in Miami, and I had listened fundraiser to for a, a fundraiser for the Clinton-Gore re-election campaign. To which you were a donor? Uh, to which I was an attendee, okay, and, and a donor. Over, over the years, uh, I, I know Terry McAuliffe because um, Miami is a hotbed of political activity, and many of our, my personal friends are very involved with the De Democratic Party and the Republican Party. In the middle 1980s, I also became involved in a lot of the political happenings, in part because of what was happening in Miami in the, in the early 1980s when it had been overrun and it was kind of paradise lost. So there was a tremendous interest in bringing the attention of the national government, the federal government, to the, the plight of what, what was happening in Dade County. I, through a friend of mine, Jerry Berlin, I met Terry McAuliffe and at that time and for years after was a, uh, a fair contributor to the Democratic Party. I've also contributed to the Republican Party, but during that time I was a member of the, uh, he was a member of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and he was involved in various other fundraising events, one of which was held at Barbara Streisand's house. And I met various political figures, both Democrats and Republicans, but primarily Democrats, and it was interesting to hear what was happening in the rest of the world and to tell them what was happening in Dade County. That is, that's the background of my knowledge of Terry. At the meeting on um, August 15th, I, I hadn't spoken to Terry McAuliffe in probably three years, and he was the one who ran the meeting. He was describing the efforts uh, to run the president's re-election campaign, and one of the primary goals was to raise a sufficient amount of money that there would not be any primary fight over the nomination. And I was sitting there and listening, and I was a potential contributor. After the meeting, I walked up with one of my friends to say hello to him, and he recognized me and said to me, you know, how are you doing? What's happening in doggydom? Doggydom was our reference to the world of, of dog racing. And uh, we started the conversation. I said, Things are really not going all that well in northern Wisconsin where we have a track. And he said, oh, I know all about that. 
And I was surprised, and there were a lot of people standing around, so I said to him, you know, please come into my office, meaning a quiet corner of the room. And when I was in that corner of the room, we had the discussion which involved his involvement with uh, Fowler and getting the, the uh, meeting set up. Now, this is particularly the part of your testimony I'm interested in. Could you recount that as explicitly as you can recall it? Yes, we went into the corner and he said to me, I said, we're having tremendous problems with um, a, an Indian casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. And he said to me, I know all about that. And I said, uh, what, what, what do you know? And he said, I was instrumental in getting that pr proposition turned down. I worked with Chairman Fowler and others to get that Delaware North proposition turned down. And they, you will not have them as competition. And I said, that's not, that track is not Delaware North, that track is us. And that was my project that was killed. And he was, he was startled by that. That was the extent of that, that conversation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Havnick, and I now recognize uh, counsel. The time that you've just taken will count out of my time and recognize counsel, James Wilson, senior investigative counsel, for 30 minutes. Mr. Havnick, good afternoon. We very much appreciate your coming here today. Uh, Representative Waxman requested that you appear today, and we're very pleased that you were able to come. Uh, I know the Hudson Dog Track has been a long ordeal for you, and we really do appreciate the candor of your opening statement, and I'd certainly like to follow up on a number of the issues that you've raised during the statement. But before we get into uh, some of the substantive issues, I wanted to ask you a few questions about the Department of Justice investigation of this matter. Has anyone from the Department of Justice ever spoken with you about Hudson Dog Track? No, they have not. Now, you've been to Wisconsin, and you've <coughs> met with tribal chairmen on a number of occasions, haven't you? Yes, I have. And you've met with numerous Department of the Interior decision makers, isn't that correct? Yes, I have. You've also met with the governor of the state of Wisconsin, have you not? Yes, I have. And you do have considerable knowledge about community support and opposition to this particular application, is that correct? Yes, I do. That is correct. Overall, would it be fair to say that, that you are one of the people who knows the most about the entire Hudson Dog Track matter, is that correct? That would be correct. You also met with a number of fundraisers and contributors, and you just recounted a story about a meeting with Terry McAuliffe, um, and you've discussed the Hudson Dog Track matter with those individuals. Is that correct? Uh, I, I, I never discussed the Hudson Dog Track matter with anyone at a fundraiser prior to the turndown in July of 1995, no. Fair enough. Now, you did mention two things in your opening statement that um, really caught our attention. One was the uh, meeting you've just recounted with uh, Mr. McAuliffe. Um, I believe at the time he was the chief fundraiser for the Clinton-Gore 1996 re-election campaign. Um, you also mentioned a meeting uh, with Mr. George Scabine, who is uh, a witness that will appear tomorrow, and uh, you discussed a meeting you had with him. And I'd like to ask you questions about that, uh, about that later. But I'll ask you again, uh, notwithstanding your involvement with this matter, you've uh, never been contacted by the Department of Justice, is that correct? I have never been contacted by the Department of Justice. Thank you. Now, I'd like to follow up a little bit with the uh, meeting that you mentioned that took place at the Lacoudre Reservation in Wisconsin. It was a meeting that, in your opening statement, you indicated George Scabine attended. Uh, do you recall what the purpose of that meeting was? Yes, the purpose of that meeting was to go over ways in which we could um, correct the situation on our application. It was to go over a, a review of where we were in the application process, even though it had been turned down. And is it fair to say you were there to participate in that review of the, the Hudson Dog Track application to that point? Yes, it is. How, how did the subject of, of the Hudson Dog Track um, rejection come up at that meeting? The, the meeting was, uh, was held in, in, the, uh, in the bingo hall of the Lacoudre, which was a fairly large room. And there were a number of questions that were asked, but the, the main question that was on the mind, minds of both the three tribes and myself was, what happened in Hudson? And, and it, it just naturally came up among the first questions mm -hmm. that were asked. 
And was that a question asked directly of Mr. Skabeen? Yes, it was. And, and what did Mr. Skabeen, when he was asked, what happened with the application? At, at first, Mr. Skabeen started answering the question in um, political terms. But when he was pressed after about the third or fourth question, he said it was kind of a mea culpa. Listen, we would have approved it or we approved it. When it got upstairs, politics took over. So he really, w I got the impression that he was trying to justify to the tribes that he was not the person who was involved in the final decision because I had always felt that he was in favor of this decision, that he was extremely sympathetic to the pl uh, tr plight of the tribes. So knowing what you knew about Mr. Skabeen's involvement, did he appear when, when he finally um, gave an explanation. Did he appear to mean what he said? Yes. Would counsel, uh, let me interrupt just a moment. Were there other witnesses there when Mr. Skabeen said that? Yes, there were. Uh, can you enumerate or give us the names of some of the people that were there? Yes. Um, Rose Gurneau from the Red Cliff uh, tribe was there. Uh, uh, Chairman Ackley was there. Bill Kadat from Lakuta was there. Margaret Diamond from Lakuta Ray was there. Al Trapania from Lakuta Ray was there. And there were probably another 10 people from the tribes, at least 10 people who were there. And there were also people from the, um, from the, interior, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs who were there. I think we, we uh, may not have all of those names. I'd like for you, to the best of your knowledge, give us a list of those, uh, because uh, we're going to have not only you under oath, but Mr. Scabine and others we want to make sure that uh, we get the correct answers on these questions. And once again, you say that he said that he was going to, he was in favor of it, but it was kicked upstairs and it was turned down by the people upstairs because of political pressure or right. it's, it's to that effect. We were not against the uh, proposal. You know, we, were, we were in favor of it. It was when it got upstairs that politics took over. Okay, thank you. Were you surprised by Mr. Scabine's answer? Um, no. Actually, I, I had really always thought that Mr. Scabine was, was very um, sensitive to the, to the needs of the tribes and sympathetic to the project. Almost everyone we had met at the, uh, at the Bureau of Indian Affairs thought that this was an excellent project because what was happening in this deal was that you were taking three Indian tribes and putting them together in a, in a business proposition, which had really never happened before. And you were throwing into the mix a non-Indian group of people, and they felt that each of the groups could learn from the others, and that there was a, a, a certain degree of business acumen that the non-Indian group would, would bring to the, to the table. And there was a certain knowledge of the uh, Wisconsin area that would be brought together by the Native Americans. So everyone who ever heard of this idea until we were turned down, to the best of our knowledge, thought it was terrific. They also thought it was terrific because it was taking land that the state had already designated as class three gaming land. The dog track is there, the dog track exists, and you know, people could argue for the next 18 years over whether or not they, there should be a dog track or whether they have to drive past the dog track, but the dog track is a fact of life. It's there and it exists. And it was taking that dog track, which had a terrific location, but we were precluded from going into that business, and I think someone made reference to the fact that we couldn't get local approval, so we went to the uh, tribes as our way of getting the casino. You cannot get local approval in Wisconsin because casino gambling is not legal for anyone but Indian tribes under IGRA. Under the compacts of the tribes, uh, there are three ways the tribes can have it gambling. Number one is on their reservations. Number two is on land taken into uh, trust prior to 1988, which was prior to the enactment of uh, IGRA. And the third is land subsequently taken into trust, which is what this fell under. So we always believe that the state and the governor who signed the compact contemplated that there would be off-reservation gambling in Wisconsin, or they never would have signed the compacts as they were. You, you brought up a, an interesting issue there, and it was the one that we've discussed a little bit uh, with the previous panel, and it was the one of expansion 
of casinos in the state of Wisconsin. And I, I'd like to take just a second and, and try and get as far as we can with that. Um, a statement was played on one of the uh, monitors here, and it was a, a campaign statement by Governor Thompson um, that indicated that he was against the expansion of gambling in Wisconsin. Um, in your view, was the proposal, the application to take land into trust, an expansion of gambling in Wisconsin? No. <clears throat> in our view, off-reservation gambling was permitted under the compacts so long as the total number did not exceed the total number that were permitted under the existing compacts. And every time Governor Thompson, and he is very careful about his use of words in gambling and expansion, we do not feel that this constitutes an expansion of gambling. We feel that it actually uh, is a contraction of gambling because instead of having a class three dog crack and three more Indian casinos, there would just be one instead of the potential for four. Well, let, let, let me just ask you a question because uh, I think some simplification is in order here. Uh, under the current compacts in the state of Wisconsin, the three tribes that are participants in the, the dog track application, the Lacouda Ray, uh, Red Cliff, and the Mole Lake Sokogan, how many casinos are they allowed to have under current compacts? Under the current compact, each one of the tribes is entitled to have two casinos. So they can have a total of six among the three tribes. And that's a potential number of six, and there's already the existing dog track, so that could be seven gambling facilities in the state of Wisconsin. Now, my understanding is that if the application had been approved, the tribes would have foregone the right to a second casino, which would have meant that they would have each had potentially one casino and then the dog track application. So instead of seven total facilities, there would have been a total of four gambling facilities in Wisconsin. Is that, that correct? That is exactly correct. So. I mean, just trying to characterize this whole discussion that we've had so far, is it fair to say that there would literally have been a fairly significant reduction in the number of casinos in the state of Wisconsin if this application had been approved? Yes. If you wanted to say that you were against the expansion of gambling, there are currently 17 casinos operating in Wisconsin. This really would have uh, reduced that number by three, there are 17 uh, operating, there would be more permitted, but it would be almost a 20% reduction in the total number of casinos, yes. And I don't think that would be construed to be an expansion. Well, and I was going to ask you, that seems to be very consistent with not only Governor Thompson's statements, but with the intent of the statements as well. He seems to have indicated he doesn't want more casinos in Wisconsin. That is correct. I I'd like to return for just a moment or two to the points you raised about Terry McAuliffe, because there were some things brought up there that may not be understood uh, by everybody. I have a copy of, of your prepared statement here. Um, and you mentioned here uh, a term, Delaware North. It says you've put in quotes, I got Delaware North's Indian casino project killed, the one that would have competed with you. Um, do you have an understanding of what the reference to Delaware North is? Yes, I do. If, if you could, just given your hindsight, explain um, the significance of, of Delaware North in the Hudson Dog Track application. Okay, Delaware North uh, had a significance in the campaign. What had happened was that in, uh, in November of 1994, we received the approval from the uh, Department of the Interior, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Minneapolis, that the land be taken into trust. We called the BIA, we, someone in my office, and we're told that it generally takes 30 days to get a, an approval once you've gotten the approval out of the regional office. Also, to the best of our knowledge and the person on the phone from BIA, there had never been an overturning of a regional office recommendation on this subject. So what had happened was a gigantic propaganda and lobbying campaign was begun against us by the tribes that did not want the additional competition. And this lobbying campaign included disparaging us by calling us other names and alluding to other things that we may have done. It, uh, it extended to everyone, it extended to the federal government, it, it extended to the local government of Hudson. 
because we got the O'Connor letter, which I think will probably come up at some point, from a, the Freedom of Information Act by requesting the city of Hudson to turn over all of the documents they had involving this to us. And we found through that, that there was direct involvement and collusion of the St. Croix Chippewa with the Hudson City Council. And it was coming in over the Hudson City Council's fax machine. And I don't think that's government in the sunshine, but that was what, in fact, was being done. So is it fair to say, then, that from your perspective, there were a great many misrepresentations made about the proposal at the time of the, the consideration in yeah, 1995? Yes, there, there were. And I believe Terry McAuliffe was misled by the people who, who were making the misrepresentations. And uh, in many respects, it, it seems that some of the opposition that um, perhaps was stated at the time might have been influenced by a, a number of the misleading statements made. Is that your understanding of that, what that happened? That is my understanding and my belief, because we had filed the application in October of 1993, and it took until November of 1994 to get the approval from the Minneapolis office. We had gone through every rule and every hoop and every procedure that the BIA had for an IGRA application. During that time, there was opposition from local people. It was read, it was digested by the BIA, and it was discounted. And I'd like to point out one other thing, just as an aside. Uh, Secretary Babbitt said in his testimony in the Senate that, the, uh, uh, that uh, Governor Thompson was irrelevant as far as his reaching his decision. So I think that would, I'd just like to clear up the record on that. But we had followed every rule, and these people had had 14 months in which to object or make any economic studies or whatever they needed done, and nothing had come up that the BIA found to be not insurmountable. It was after the approval from uh, Minneapolis that we were just hit with this firestorm of lobbying and political innuendo and everything else. Just finishing up on the matter of your conversation with Mr. McAuliffe, prior to your seeing him at the fundraiser you described, uh, did you have any reason to believe or did you know whether Mr. McAuliffe had any involvement in the Hudson Dog Track matter? I, I had no reason to believe that he did and uh, up until really almost the end we felt that the merits of our case were so strong that this whole thing would be decided on its merits and that politics would never get involved in it. So it's, it sounds like it's fair to say that his candid statement came as a great surprise to you. A very great surprise, yes. Hearing that I knew the person responsible it was very surprising. Um, I'd like to put up, if we, if we can, an exhibit. Uh, it's in the book in front of you, uh, Exhibit 317. It's a memorandum to Jennifer O'Connor from David Myers. What, what, what number is it? It's, it's number exhibit 317. And uh, it takes me a long time to leaf through these things as well. I'm lucky I have one pulled out. Um, this is a memorandum to Jennifer O'Connor from David Myers, dated June 6, 1995, uh, regarding Wisconsin dog track. Now, just by way of information, Jennifer O'Connor and David Myers uh, both work for uh, Deputy White House Counsel, then Deputy White House uh, Chief of Staff, Harold Ickes. And I wanted to turn your attention to the second paragraph, but before I do that, I'll say the second sentence reads, uh, at that time they are 95% certain that the application will be turned down. And then in the second paragraph, uh, it reads, nonetheless, she stated that they will probably decline without offering much explanation because their discretion in this matter, because of their discretion in this matter. Um, I wanted to get your sense of, of this whole um, sense of the declining without much explanation. Um, when did you, have you ever seen this memo before? Yes, I did. When did you first see the memo? I saw it about three months ago. And on, on one of the uh, document, we have a, uh, a lawsuit against the um, Bureau of the uh, Department of the Interior that is uh, currently going on in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, 
the, the department is very slow in getting documents to us. I, I, I don't think this committee would understand that you don't get documents when you ask for them, but we have a tremendously difficult time getting any documents. I, I think I don't mean to cut off anybody, but we've got some experience in um, but, slow receipt of documents, but please continue. As they uh, dribble out, and the White House is particularly slow in, uh, in producing documents in, in the lawsuit. As these, as these uh, and I know you have no experience in that, but I'm just <laughs> telling you as an expert witness. Um, I did see this, though, it, uh, about three months ago. It was one of the uh, documents that was produced under a request that we had made, probably a fourth request, but yes. And when you saw this, this sentence, they will probably decline without offering much explanation. How did you feel? I felt that uh, they really understood what had happened. I felt that they really understood that the current local opposition, that means opposition that was existing at this time in 1995, was manufactured by the opposition. The local opposition was manufactured by them. The federal opposition was being manufactured by them. Because prior to November 1994, no one really seemed to care much about what was happening with this op application not people in Wisconsin or other than some of the local people, and that they understood that this was all part of this bigger campaign, but nonetheless, they were going to turn it down anyway. They were not going to do what was right. Now, the memo that we have that we're looking at right now is from one member of Harold Ickey's staff to another member of Harold Ickey's staff, and uh, it, it states at the very beginning that there had been a conversation with Heather Sibison um, and that's how the information was transmitted to Harold Ickey's office. Um, were you surprised to see that Heather Sibison, who worked in Secretary Babbitt's office, uh, was telling people in Deputy Chief of Staff Ickey's office uh, that they will decline without offering much explanation? Okay, at the time that I saw this memo, which was three months ago, I was not surprised to um to see that because I, I have no proof myself, but I believe that it w politics was the reason that we were turned down. But I would have been very surprised to have seen this memo at the time that it was written. I felt the merits of our case w were so strong and that the uh, Department of the Interior was really above political type things and that this would never in enter into anyone's consideration. I'd like to turn from that memo and, and if we could, put up on the board uh, a presidential directive. It's uh, marked Exhibit 350-1 in the book of exhibits in front of you, Mr. Havanek. If you could please turn your attention to that. Can I get that number once more? Please? Yes, it's um, Exhibit 350-1, 350. Yes. This is a, a memorandum. It's uh, titled Government to Government Relations with Native American Tribal Governments, dated April 29, 1994. Uh, and I'd like to turn your attention to the section B in this memorandum, and, and I'll read it uh, for clarity in the record. It states, each executive department and agency shall consult to the greatest extent practicable and to the extent permitted by law with tribal governments prior to taking actions that affect federally recognized tribal governments. All such consultations are to be open and candid so that all interested parties may evaluate for themselves the potential impact of relevant proposals. Now, bearing in mind you're not a, a tribal government or associated with one, but you're a, a close observer of the whole Hudson Dog Track uh, application process, did what you saw in that process have any bearing or relation to this presidential directive that we've just looked at? What we saw in that process was 180 degrees opposed to the directive. And, and how so? There was never any consultation with the tribes. There was never any attempt to resolve whatever may have been a problem with the application. As late as early June, we were told by the department people, George Scabine and Mr. Hartman, that the application was proceeding along and that there may be a couple of questions, one of which was the parking lot, which we'll get into later, but that those economic issues really are handled by the National Indian uh, Gaming Commission. 
and the economic issues are not normally handled by the Department of the Interior, and that if there were any problems, we would be notified. And none of us was ever notified as to any deficiencies in the application. Just with the, with the council, yield, I just want to make sure I understand that. You were told that you would be notified if there was any problems. Yes, we were. And there was no, no notification ever forthcoming? No, sir. The okay. first communication we got that there was a problem was the July 14th letter. Thank you. Just referring again to um, the memorandum in, in Harold Ickey's office with information communicated by Ms. Sibison that they will probably decline without offering much explanation. How does that square, if at all, with the presidential directive that we were just discussing? I, I would think that was diametrically opposed to the um, presidential directive. And that, that would show an utter disregard, in my opinion, it shows an utter disregard on her part and the other people who were part of that communication to the essence of what is asked for in this directive. The, the memo that we, we were looking at, the June 6th memo, um, was drafted about six weeks before the application was ultimately uh, denied. At that time, had anybody from the Department of the Interior ever identified anything that would be considered a potentially fatal defect in the application? No, they had not. To, to your knowledge, had anybody ever told the chairman of the Couture, the Red Cliff, the Mole Lake Sokogan, or any of their representatives that if you don't fix problem X by date Y, we're going to reject your application? No, they had not. On the other side of this question, had the Department of the Interior ever sent the opposite signal? Had they ever communicated that the application was going to be approved? Yes, they had. And if you could very briefly, and I, I stress briefly, um, provide a couple of highlights of what you know about what was communicated to you as far as approval. Yes, on May 17th, uh, there had been a meeting with um, Mr. Duffy and uh, the tribes, and I was there, and Paul Eckstein was there. After that meeting, we went down to um, Mr. Scabine's office, and Mr. Scabine and Mr. Hartman were there, and we had just gone over the general um, uh, uh, precepts of what was involved in the application, and they told us that there was nothing, nothing in it that was fatal, and everything was moving along smoothly. And um, we then had another meeting, I believe on May 30th, either at the end of May or beginning of June, with Mr. Scabine and Mr. Hartman again, at which time there was a question about the parking lot and there was a question about a few other things. There was a question about some land that had made it appear as though the property were landlocked. But what in effect had happened was that we had given land to St. Croix County to build that four lane highway and the deed was not shown in the uh, papers that were put in. But the road is contiguous to the property and that was cleared up. But there was, we were told that there was, there was nothing that was fatal to the application and in fact it was moving along and we would be notified. Okay, I'm down to my last two or three minutes so I'm going to start talking quickly and I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to read you a passage from a document that we just recently received and I'd like to have your views on it very briefly. Um, if, if we could put up on the screen uh, exhibit 335-1 please. Again, that's in the book in front of you, Mr. Havanick, at, at 335. And if you'll, if you'll turn your attention to um, the second page, uh, it states, we are primarily concerned about our ability to show that plaintiffs were told about and given an opportunity to remedy the problems which the department ultimately found were outcome determinative. Area directors are told to give applicants an opportunity to cure problems, and it will be hard to argue persuasively that applicants lose this opportunity once the central office begins its review. The administrative record, as far as we can tell, contains no record of department meetings or communications with the applicant tribes in which the department's concerns were expressed to plaintiffs. These communications may have occurred, but they simply are not documented in, in the record. Uh, in, in a one-word answer, yes or no, does this representation 
uh, comport with what you know about what happened in the dog track application? Yes, there was no communication. Just for the record, I know this is a, a Department of Justice analysis of the case uh, in this particular matter. Just, um, my time's running out. I wanted to ask you, we're having witnesses this afternoon. It's very quick. We didn't expect that. One of the witnesses um, who will testify is uh, Ms. Nancy Birogel. Um My understanding is that Ms. Birogel at one point attempted to enter into a business deal with um, the Hudson Dog Track. Is that correct or false? That is correct. Um, could you provide a fairly brief indication of what that deal was? Yes, the, the general manager of the track told me that uh, she was attempt she's in the water business, bottled water or some kind of water business, and she was attempting to sell water to the track. We do not control the concessions at the track. That's controlled by a company called Ogden, and we have no control of, over what, where any of those supplies come from. I do believe that Ogden did not buy the, uh, the water from her. So it, it's fair to say that you rejected her uh, advances in terms of this proposed business deal? Uh, well, my, my wife is here, so I would like phrase it. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> I apologize. I, I have no further questions for now. Before we, uh, the gentleman yields back the balance of his time, unless, any, unless any colleagues that may be prejudicial to uh, li ongoing litigation against uh, the Department of Interior, but this is the kind of document that does reflect the attorney's opinion to a client and it was put in without the client's concurrence. Uh, I understand that the Department of Interior is drafting a letter to the committee asserting attorney-client privilege over this document that I referred to in my opening statement today that the committee will have questions about it and that has already been included in the record pursuant to the second and third unanimous consent requests adopted today and was not objected to by anybody on the committee. And so uh, the minority has a copy of the letter that the interior officials have represented to my staff as a draft. However, it was uh, signed and not stamped draft. I, I, uh, let me just say for the record, this committee takes its responsibility seriously. Mr. Even Chairman. though we may have many disagreements, the committee is often... <laughs> Gentlemen, let me conclude. Even though we have many disagreements, the committee has often come together on issues which impact the Congress as an institution. If the Secretary of the Interior thinks that a lawyer in the office of the solicitor can write a letter asserting attorney-client privilege over a document that the Department admitted in its January 12, 1998 letter to the committee was not subject to any privilege vis-a-vis -vis the Congress, he is mistaken. The Secretary must assert a contravailing claim of executive privilege which trumps Congress oversight responsibility. When the chairman, when then Chairman Dingell subpoenaed certain EPA litigation documents, President Reagan, whether right or wrong on the law, had the courage to sign the letter asserting the privilege. In Chairman Dingell's view, review of environmental litigation involved uh, ongoing uh, criminal investigation. Let me also say that this last minute behind the scenes maneuvering makes little difference. The document in question was included in the record pursuant to the second and third unanimous consent request agreed to today. Furthermore, Members of the committee under the committee's document protocol are permitted to use any document except classified documents during the hearing. Some members of this committee have asserted that the department's decision was correct. Others disagree. The American people should be the ultimate arbiters of the truth and should have as much information as possible. I believe the American people have a right to know. I think it's in order to allow this to be in the record and it has so been inserted in the record now. You have a point of order? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentleman will state his point of order. In reliance, when the chairman asked unanimous consent to include certain documents in the record, I was not aware of the fact that it was in contest that having a lawyer-client privilege. And I think the chair takes in extraordinary advantage of this committee. That henceforth, let it be known that when you ask for unanimous consent for the admission of anything, I can no longer trust you, and I would like to have it appear on the record that I have a blanket <coughs> objection. There has, there, has been no there has been no assertion from the Secretary of the Interior regarding privilege on this document. Now, you know, uh, you could question my integrity. No, you, you gave us justification because you offered it by unanimous consent, and there was no objection that it was a matter of being put in the record and everyone was in consent. I did that as a member of the Congress of the United States and a member of this committee, respecting the fact that the chairman would never abuse 
the minority of this committee or the majority of this committee by making an offer unless it had been patently agreed upon by all parties concerned that it was legitimately to be entered in the record as a matter of course under unanimous consent. You have abused this committee's respect you're, you're, for you're unanimous stating, consent. You're not stating a point of order, but let me say the minority counsel was advised of the documents we put in the record. If you want to take issue with somebody, take issue with your minority counsel for not informing you. Not a point of order, anyhow. Mr. Chairman. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Regular order has been called for and will be granted. We have a motion. Point of order. Us. Point of order. Gentleman will General. state his point of order. Uh, I want the uh, record to be clear that the minority counsel was not informed, to my knowledge, that that uh, that uh, the unanimous consent was for depositions to be put in the record, but not this particular letter. I don't think it was appropriate to put it in or be referred to, but that is your decision. I wanted to make note for the record that that document was considered attorney-client privilege and you've used it. So that, that point is, should stand on the record. And uh, I withdraw my point of order, which I did not make properly. The minority council did consult with the majority council and they agreed that the interior department had waived that privilege. Well. I'm not going to get into a correct. big, long debate about it. That's not the, correct. The, 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 you, may, you may interpret it in any way you want. It is in the record. It is uh, going to be utilized by the committee. Now, you have a motion before us. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes on your motion. Mr. Chairman, as I said in the beginning of this hearing, I think it's appropriate for us to get the testimony of the witnesses who have uh, uh, information to give us to get a complete uh, understanding of the uh, facts of this uh, episode in uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I've requested that uh, a number of witnesses be brought to the committee, to be invited to come to the committee. I made a motion that is now pending that we issue invitations or subpoenas uh, to, um, to uh, Governor Thompson, Congressman Gunderson, and State representative from the area, Sheila Harzov and Hilda Manuel, who is the uh, person in the department in charge of making the determination and of the uh, application. I think we ought to have those people brought uh, before this uh, panel so we can get the full information. There was even a dispute this morning. Mr. Souter raised the question of what Governor Thompson meant and when he meant it, when he said he opposed it. Uh, and, and whether he did oppose it at the time when it would have been appropriate for him to oppose it or whether he supported it at one time and opposed it at another. These are very legitimate questions and the best way to get the answers to them is to have the witnesses before us. I request this, uh, uh, requested of the chairman, he has not seen fit to grant uh, the uh, approval of these witnesses to be brought before us and now I make a motion uh, and hope to have support on a bipartisan basis that uh, we have uh, these witnesses included so we can have a full and complete uh, transcript and record in this hearing uh, so that we can get all the information, not just part of the information. Uh, has the gentleman concluded? I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, let me just say that uh, we uh, listened to the request from uh, the minority. We weighed that very seriously. Uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, for my majority, members as well as minority members asked for eight minority witnesses. He asked for eight of them. It would have required two extra days of hearings according to uh, our staff. Uh, this would e e easily take in a lot more time than we wanted to uh, dedicate to this, uh, this part of the investigation. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, did you have a comment, uh, Mr. Lantos? Is, is, is that analogous to the comments you made to the independent counsel when he was here? Now, you, you do not have the floor, Mr. Lantos, oh, point, and I would, I would expect you, as a member of this committee, to abide by the rules. I will recognize you and give you your time, and, and I will keep my mouth shut, and when I have the time, I will respectfully request you keep yours shut. Now, we have granted the minority four witnesses. Mr. Scabine, uh, Michael Anderson, Nancy Burrell, and Fred Havanick. This is far more generous than we were, uh, th far more generous to the minority than they ever were when uh, we were in the minority, ever.
And so I respectfully request that the majority members join with me in defeating this motion. The motion is now before us. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I request a roll call vote. The gentleman from California requests a roll call vote and a roll call vote will be granted. <coughs> the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Cox, Ms. Ross Layton, Mr. McHugh, Mr. Horn, Mr. Micah, Mr. Davis of Virginia, Mr. McIntosh, Mr. Souter, Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? No. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu? No. Mr. Sessions? Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Barr? Mr. Miller? Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Mr. Fatah? Aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Turner? Mr. Allen? Mr. Ford? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are eight ayes and ten nays. The motion uh, fails. Uh, the gentleman from California is recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. I wonder if I might be recognized Double out of order to make a unanimous question. consent request. Uh, reserving the right to object, I think you better clear it with us first and let us go on with our time. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I. With uh, the gentleman's interest in mind, I would ask unanimous consent that the written testimony, as it may be submitted timely to this committee, of the witnesses that it was proposed we hear from just now uh, be included in the record. Reserving the right to object, I don't, I don't understand the request, and it's our turn to ask questions, so why doesn't he just temporarily pull it back and we'll try to find out what he wants part of the record that isn't already part of the record? I assume object objection is heard. Mr. Uh, Waxman, you're recognized for 30 minutes. Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me point out to the members for their information, it's laughable at the idea that Mr. Skabeen, Mr. Uh, Havanick, and Mr. Anderson, who are going to testify in this hearing, should be considered our witnesses, since they're so essential to any kind of explication of what went on in this uh, casino issue. Uh, and I regret that we were denied again uh, at any opportunity for getting a um, fair hearing out of the four days that this committee is devoting to this issue. I was away uh, during Mr. Havanick's testimony. Uh, I, I was at a, another meeting, and uh, Mr. Konjorski uh, acted as the ranking member on, under those circumstances, and I want to yield to him 10 minutes at this time to begin the uh, questioning for our side, and then I'll have Thank further questions much. on my own. Mr. Uh, Mr. Havanick, uh, you originally started this proposition, as I understand it, with another Indian tribe, is that correct? Yes, we did. And why was it that that Indian tribe did not continue as an applicant? What had happened was that that Indian tribe approached us in June of 1992 to um, form a joint venture and have the land under the track taken into trust, and then we could have the uh, 
Okay, you did not approach them. They approached you. They approached us. You well, never had a thought. Could you pull the mic closer to you, please, so we could hear you better? Thank you. You, you, they approached us. This was never an original thought of yours to convert this to a Los, uh, uh, Las Vegas-type casino. It was really the Indians' idea. It was the idea of the St. Croix okay. Chippewa Management Company. Okay, right. There was a management company at the St. Croix Chippewa. And um, this management company approached us to see if we would be interested in entering into a joint venture with them where we would apply to have the land under the track taken into trust. And then we would be able to offer the um, other games that the uh, tribes are allowed to offer that we cannot. We worked with that tribe from June of 1992 until December of 1992. And during that time, we grew to uh, not trust the management company of that tribe. You, I believe one of the uh, Democratic members today recited a story about how Indian tribes had been ripped off on the slot machines and that they could have bought the slot machines in three months for what they paid uh, leasing fees for for about three or four years. The St. Croix was one of the tribes that was involved in that. We did not like that business tactic. The second thing that was done by that management company was that they owned the land around the casino so that there was a the casino was the hole in the donut but they controlled the access to the casino and we did not like the way that company did business we value our paramutual licenses very very highly the ones in florida the ones in texas and the ones in wisconsin and we every year have to submit applications in which we've got to show every person and group and entity with whom we have any type of business arrangement. We were fearful of having a business arrangement with the St. Croix group as it was then constituted that it could hurt our licensing in, in other states, renewal of licenses. It, it, it took 18 months to carry on this type of negotiation and discover that. No, it took from June of 1992 until December of 1992. It took six months for us to realize that these were not the people we wanted to be in bed with. It wasn't the fact that they weren't, wouldn't agree to the terms of uh, the conditions and the splitting of profits. No, it was not. They were really the ones who came to us with the terms and the conditions and everything else. And uh, their terms were uh, better than what you eventually gave the tribes? three tribes or were they worse? The terms of the deal with the um, St. Croix group was uh, that the group was getting 40%. The, the non-Indian group was getting 40% and the tribes were getting 60%. And we were then going to split that between the two of us. But our reason for not dealing so with So you would have ended up with a lesser profit if you'd gone with the first deal then you went with the second deal. Our reason for not going with the first deal was that we did not want to deal with the people who were involved in the first deal. It had nothing to do with the economic terms. It had to do with that. That was just coincidental. It, 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 you wouldn't get as big a profit out of the deal if you went with their deal. That, that is just coincidental. I see. Uh, the uh, Indians were uh, of the finally the four feather group, the three tribes that we had here this morning. Uh, they came with the terms of this agreement and said what they wanted, or did you propose what, what the split was going to be? We made the proposal to the second uh, group of tribes. It was so our. So you really set the terms that you were going to get a greater profit by dealing with this new set of three Indian tribes than you would have ended up with the first Indian tribe. We didn't want to deal with the first group, and it really is not clear as to who would get what percentage of the 40 percent, because that deal was never finalized. I see. But hey. we were the ones who came, went to the, yeah. the other groups of tribes with whom it, we are now partners. In your testimony, it sounded like that uh, you were uh, hanging around Wisconsin, and you saw these poor uh, Indian tribes out there, and you just felt a tremendous compulsion to go out and make sure that they made more money. And it had nothing to do with the fact that you were stuck with this dead dog track that was losing money, and you were able to take that and convert it by getting all the money you invested paid back to you by the agreement, $39 million, 
even though you'd reduce the tax rate uh, valuation on the track to $2.2 million or $2.5 million. And you were also uh, uh, made a, a fairly sweetheart deal on the, on the parking lot, where you were able to convert that into a revenue stream without having it put into the trust fund. Is that correct? That is, that is not correct. I'm sorry if you misunderstood what I had said earlier. Just so that you understand how this all happened, Congress passed IGRA, and IGRA gave the tribes the right to have gaming. We are not permitted to have gaming. There was a case in California called the Cabazon case, and in the Cabazon case, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the Indian tribes were allowed to conduct any type of gaming which was legal within the borders of the state. I understand that. Okay, which was not criminally prohibited. You're making a point, though, Mr. I know okay, what the Okay, the law point is, is that, that when Justice Crabb ruled that the lottery legalized slot machines, that, yep. for all intents and purposes, killed the dog track. I never went to the tribes and told them that I was going to be their benefactor. I why said didn't you, why didn't you just that we each had something good to bring to the table, why, as any good business deal should have. Why didn't you just offer the dog track up for sales and let the Indian tribes get together and buy the dog track and put a casino in? Because they didn't have the means to buy it. I see. But the, uh, 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 the first Indian group would have had the means because they had a management company. I, I, I can't speak for the first Indian group. I can only speak for the deal that actually came to fruition, and the tribes just didn't have the economic wherewithal to do that. I, 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 I react to the idea that I don't particularly like these arrangements, and as you heard this morning when I talked to the three Indian tribes, I, I don't think they struck a very good deal. Now, uh, you, now that you've cleared that up, they didn't really strike a deal. You went and you told them what terms you'd take them in as partners on. So you really put the deal together. No. What happened was I went to the tribes with a proposal. And, and the they proposal accepted was No, they did not accept it. It took us almost 14 months to negotiate the agreement. I, I'm not sure if you've seen the agreement or not, but the agreement is a very intricate, complicated agreement. And they negotiated among themselves and with us because there were other questions that the tribes had to ask each other. Le Couture has more members than Radcliffe. So Le Couture could have said, well, let's do this on a per capita basis. The concept was everybody would be fair and equal to each of the partners. The tribes would be well, fair and equal to each other and to us, and we would be fair and equal. But we didn't go to these tribes and say, here's a deal, no. take it or leave it, or we're going down the street. But it wasn't quite that you, you put this deal together to take care of the welfare of the poor Indians now. I mean, we, is that, that's not what you want the record to reflect, is it? No. This was a business proposition this where was you a, clearly a, saw uh, taking a losing asset and converting it into a very profitable asset. Congress had, through IGRA, had given the I, Indians I, I, an I, economic tool, and we were saying to them, right. you Mr. Havik, use your I, tool I, I probably with voted us. for that piece of legislation. I never anticipated people from Florida coming up and making deals in Wisconsin to make casinos. I, in a, I mean, I think you've heard of the expression of a lot of the members of this committee. I think we probably should spend our time and to see whether or not this whole act has been abused by the gaming forces of this country who are really using Indians as shells. But that being forgotten, that was not the case in this deal. Let, let me ask you, you're a businessman, you said that, and you engaged in activities with both political parties. Have you ever contributed funds to the Democratic National Committee? Yes, I have. Have you ever contributed funds to the Republican National Committee? Yes, I have. Have you ever contributed funds uh, to any other uh, candidates on a state or local level? Yes, I have. Uh, can you tell us whether or not you have uh, uh, contributed what amount of funds in the current year or say since 1992? How many, how much contributions have you politically made to both parties, to all candidates that you can recall, you and your wife and your uh, uh, business associates and uh, real, allied corporations? I would guess about $50,000. Maximum? Uh, yes. And that's all the corporations in Florida and that's all the gaming operations throughout the country? I believe so, yes. I think I have some information here that you, Governor Thompson's contributions may have exceeded $12,000 in just two years. Did he receive more than 25 percent of the contributions that you made? He may have, yes. I see. Yep. I yield back. Th thank you very much, Mr. Konjorski, for yielding back. Uh, Mr. Havenick, uh, pleased to see you today. Let, let me start off by saying that uh, 
You're a businessman. I, I don't think you've done anything wrong. I don't think you've done anything improper. You're a successful businessman. You're trying to make some money out of a failing dog track, uh, and there's not absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, what I want to do is to explore with you where we are and this reason this issue has now come before this committee, uh, which ordinarily doesn't have oversight over dog tracks, Indian gaming, uh, or decisions at the Department of Interior. Um, just so I can get some kind of timeline on all of this, uh, as I understand it, in 1986, gambling was illegal in Wisconsin. Is that right? Was Ill illegal. Illegal. Yes, sir. And then they changed the law in 87. They adopted amendment to its constitution, and it permitted a narrow exception to gambling, which included dog uh, track betting. It, it, the, uh, in 1987, it permitted dog racing, horse racing, uh, snowmobile racing, and the lottery. Or the lottery, I believe the lottery at the same time. Okay. And Pardon me? Separately, yeah. but it was all in 1987, and prior then, to and that. And in 1988, we sort of got a, some, just to get the chronology. In 1988, your company, H-A-H -A -H Enterprises, uh, first unveiled its dog track in Hudson. Is that correct? That's correct. And in 1989, a lot happened. You were granted a license for this facility, but then the... The mayor who supported it was recalled for supporting uh, this uh, dog track. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. The next big event is in 1991. The dog track opened, and as you testified at the same time, Indi Indian casinos began operating near the dog track. The result was that the track began to lose money. Is that correct? That is correct. In 1992, according to your testimony, you know that you can never... Uh, you knew that you couldn't compete with the Indian casinos. You knew that because state law forbids casino gambling, you face severe legal hurdles in building your own casino. Thus, you came up with the idea of a business deal with an Indian tribe. And if you can persuade the Department of Interior to approve a transfer of your land to a, tra a tribe, your land ceases to be subject to state laws. You could then build a casino on it. And you approach the nearest tribe, which is the St. Croix Chippewa, with this idea they're about 30 miles away. They're interested in pursuing your concept. You announce an agreement in principle with them in August 1992. There, there's one correction that I would make in that, and that is that the St. Croix Chippewa approached us. We, we did not approach them. They but ev everything you. else you said was correct. Okay. But they're now uh, proposing to go into business with the, uh, the, uh, Saint, the St. Croix Chippewa tribe. Correct. And run a casino in your property. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> it would no longer be our property, but yes. Okay, there's a local opposition. The Hudson City Council adopts a resolution opposing the casino. In December, there's a local referendum narrowly passing in Hudson 51 to 49, but loses by a 2 to 1 margin in Troy, which surrounds the dog track on three sides. The St. Croix tribe pulls out in December 1992. Is that all accurate? The only uh, thing is it was a, a mutual termination between us and the St. Croix. Okay. At, at, at this point, you're searching now for a new tribal partner. In August and October 1993, you find three tribes, the three we heard from this morning. They're all much further from the site than the St. Croix band, but uh, uh, nevertheless, you engage then in a partnership with these three tribes. It, it, we began uh, negotiating in February of 1993. In early 1994, you enter into a service contract with the city of Hudson. At the same time, however, local opposition begins to mount. Over 3,100 Hudson area residents sign a petition to Governor Tommy Thompson and Secretary Babbitt opposing the casino. The supervisors of the town of Troy vote, voted unanimously against the casino. Is that correct? The 3,100 uh, person petition is subject to question. No one ever verified the signatures, and I believe that most of them were not from Hudson. Okay. In 1995, the local opposition intensified. And in February, the Hudson City Council voted against the proposal. In March, 30 members of the state legislature, led by Sheila Harsdorf, the Republican representative from Hudson, wrote in opposition to the casino. In April, the Republican congressman from the area, Steve Gunderson, and the Democratic Attorney General, Jim Doyle, both wrote in opposition. In May, Congressman Tom Barrett uh, of this committee joined them. In June, Governor Thompson and Senator Feingold also announced their opposition. During this period, the lobbying campaign begins in earnest, or 
No, it actually began in earnest in January of 1995. Okay. The lobbyists for the opponents of the casino began to have their contacts with the department and the White House. In response to this mounting opposition, you hired two lobbyists, Paul Eckstein, who was Secretary Babbitt's former law partner, and Jim Moody, a former congressman. These lobbyists are uh, the only ones to meet with Secretary Babbitt. The department finally announced its decision in July, and then you filed suit in September. Is all that correct? All that is correct. Okay. Now, the, you've been in lawsuit, uh, you've been facing a lawsuit in, on this issue for a couple of years now. Yes, we have. And, and you've been main, may have maintained that uh, there were procedural improprieties, but that also there were political improprieties. And that the um, political improprieties, that, according to the affidavits that have been filed, uh, have to do with the uh, statement by Mr. Eckstein of, as he relates what uh, Secretary Babbitt had to say. Today you testified that, about... That among, that among others. Okay. Uh, well, whatever others there might have been today for the first time, you mentioned Terry McCulloch when you say that he approached you to help stop the casino. Why wasn't that in any of your previous affidavits? Uh, uh, could you repeat that? Who just joined you at the table, by the way, so we can have it for the record? My, my name is Robert Freebert, and I'm one of the attorneys. Okay, so I hope we have that for the record. You went on the microphone, but... Would you, could you just well, repeat well, I, that? Well, I, today is the first time you mentioned Terry McAuliffe, this anecdote about Terry McAuliffe. That never appeared in any other place. It wasn't in any of your affidavits. It wasn't in any of the other public statements, private statements, statements in the litigation. Why not? Okay, for, I've never given an affidavit in the litigation. I'm not really a party in the litigation, but it was never mentioned also because of lawyer-client privilege. Uh, well, how was product. it lawyer-client privilege? It was work privilege. product. Pardon? How was a lawyer client? It was work, work product in, in with the attorney. No, I, I, you, you related in your testimony that you had a social conversation with Terry McAuliffe and that he came over to you and said, I took care of your problem. No, and it I, turned out he was on the wrong, he, he, thought, he thought you were on the other side of the Well, he didn't know issue. I had a problem until I said something to him and then he said, I took care of that. Yeah, it sounded like he was... He didn't come over and volunteer that he had taken care of that because... I don't think before that he knew I had anything to do with Wisconsin. It didn't sound like he knew much of what he was talking about when he talked to you at the time either. Oh, he knew about Hudson and he knew about the problem and he knew that the uh, that the thing had been killed. Yes, he did. Yeah, but he thought, evident from your testimony, it sounds like you were telling us that he thought you were happy with what he had done. He did because he had been misled through, well, I said that there was this massive propaganda and lobbying campaign to discredit us and he had been told that the non-Indian applicant in the Hudson Casino case was another company, not us. So he was misled too. Why wasn't this ever mentioned before? This is central to your lawsuit. Why, why is this the first time you're uh, raising an anecdote about uh, uh, a, lo a lobbyist or a fundraiser who was trying to take credit for something and then he looks like his, according to your statement, I told Terry that it was my project, that I, that I was the one who owned the track in Hudson and then his face dropped. He clearly was in shock. He said little else. It sounded like he was, thought he was taking credit with you, and it turned out he was telling you he had opposed you. The, the not, this is the, a strategy in a lawsuit that, as you have said, has been going on for a very long time. And on advice of my attorney, this is th what we've done. Well, why? You haven't said anything about this until now, well, as your attorney who, who decided would, who, this is the time who would to I, Who would I have said something to? That was the strategy. Well, there, there could have been some. What was, and tell me the strategy. Not to no, talk. No, about. that is the work product. The whole basis of your lawsuit yes. is there was political interference. Isn't that right? No, that is not correct. Isn't it partly right? There are two parts to it. The, but the main uh, basis of our lawsuit is that there were procedural errors in the okay. way in which the uh, the application was handled and that there was a failure to consult with the tribes as we found out even more information about today the second part is that there were political improprieties yes okay now as to political improprieties that's the reason we're having this hearing yes and as to political improprieties it has never been mentioned 
although it would have been helpful to your cause to have mentioned that there was some reason that Terry McAuliffe might have been involved in this issue. It was our strategy that we handle the lawsuit in the way in which we're handling the lawsuit. Okay, could, maybe your attorney can tell us what the strategy is. Uh, you, you had a strategy to say that Babbitt did something improper. You had a strategy to say that uh, the tribes maybe weren't included, that were partners of yours in some of these discussions. You had a strategy to think, that, to claim that there was political pressure. And one of the evidence you give to us today is an anecdote that you never brought forward to indicate that there was uh, some further support for your contentions. And that seems to me very peculiar that hasn't been brought up before. Want to hear a uh, response, Mr. Waxman? Yes. That's why I'm asking the question. Mr. McAuliffe's name has come up in the litigation uh, through documents that have been filed in the federal court. And we've been attempting to obtain permission to take his deposition. As I'm sure all of you here understand in the context of litigation, uh, there is a great value to surprise. And that's all I care to say about it. Well, didn't you violate that strategy of surprise by announcing it today? He never. The question was asked, and he answered. And I don't have to respond to that as to what you asked the question. Wait, speak, to the, speak into the microphone. You asked the question as to why it wasn't responded to or mentioned previously. Yes. Today is today. The past is history. Okay, so in other words, you change your strategy. You were going to surprise Mr. McAuliffe because you were going to ask for his deposition, so you didn't want to mention that he, he was under... Point of order, Mr. Chairman. What is the point? The attorney has yeah, not been sworn in, and he's testifying. Well, it's a gentleman... I was asking I, that I, same question. I just don't... Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, I would like you to stay, because you're here, and you are uh, already, with your consent of your client, come forward. What I find peculiar is that you had a strategy to surprise him, and suddenly today the strategy changed by announcing that Mr. McAuliffe's uh, was taking credit for something. Of course, it turns out he turned out it turned out he was taking credit for something that was the exact exact opposite of what he thought he was doing because he looked like he was pretty embarrassed. Now, Mr. Havenick, you you complained to your friend Jerry Berlin about the denial of the Hudson application. Uh, did you not? Yes, I did. Did you ever tell him what you said about Terry McAuliffe to us today? Are you aware? I, 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 does he, have you ever told him about Terry McAuliffe? Or? No, I have not. And why not? Because it was the... I met Terry McAuliffe on August 15th, 1995. We filed the lawsuit in the Western District of Wisconsin on September 15th, 1995. From September 15th, 1995 until today, the lawsuit continues. And I have been operating under the strategy of the lawsuit from that time Forward. There was only a four-week time period between the meeting with Mr. McAuliffe and the filing of the lawsuit. Well, I, I uh, don't know the facts in your case, but I've been around Washington and politics a long time, and I do know that there are lobbyists and fundraisers who are anxious to say things that please people, especially people who uh, may well contribute to the campaigns. And uh, it sounds like Mr. McAuliffe was trying to take credit for something a, 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 with you, and then he was shocked to find out that what he was pumping up as to his good uh, actions was exactly the opposite of what you would have wanted to, to be the result. I, I really can't speak for why he did it, or you know, but it, it, it had the opposite effect of whatever effect he thought it would have on me. Okay. Well, I went through that long timeline with you, and I thought it was important to do it, because whether the t tribes approached you or you approached them, you were the big partner in this whole thing because you're the one paying most of the bills. And what I think is important is that uh, the real struggle is between you and the local community. You want to build a casino in Hudson because it's close to Minneapolis. It would be very lucrative to have a casino right there. The local community opposed a Las Vegas casino in their midst. There's nothing wrong with having a dispute like this. It's just a lot different than the picture that I hear being painted, where uh, 
it was as if you had all the merits on your side, there wasn't an argument on the other side, and lo and behold, what ought, should have been a, a slam dunk gets overturned by the Department of Interior. How could that be except through skullduggery? And I think that uh, is a picture that is not an accurate one. Well, may, may I answer that? Sure. Uh, what we are saying is that we went through every rule and regulation that IGRA required in order to take the land into trust. Included in that was a, were, were statements from the local community about the impact of the proposed casino on their communities. The statements that were sent in by the City of Hudson and by St. Croix County that are part of the record of, that led to the decision from the Bureau of Interior in the um, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs in November of 1994 supported the casino. There was no finding of detriment to either the city or the county in the official records that were transmitted How to the... To, to the Bureau of, of Indian Affairs. How do you explain, despite all that, that the governor came out against it, the attorney general? The, the governor, uh, we, we, the, uh, we hold... The local hold that congressmen, the, the state the, representatives, the, they all came out against this. I will tell you what we say. We say that, number one, we're not sure that the governor came out against it. The governor has come out against an expansion of gambling, which we discussed before as to whether this really constitutes an expansion or doesn't constitute an expansion. With regard to all of the other people who came out so strongly against it, all of that occurred after January of 1995. In the 14 months prior to that, there was no congressional opposition to the, the proposal. Under the normal time stand that is taken in these things, there was no governmental opposition. In fact, there was governmental approval. There was government uh, 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 agreements for services. None of this happened until this massive campaign began in January of 1995, at which time the Interior Department reopened the uh, hearings on this, or reopened the, whatever they would call it on this, without telling the applicant tribes for a six-week period after a meeting on uh, February 8th with the, the Minnesota delegation. Yeah, let me and it was during this time that unbelievable amounts of money and unbelievable lobbying and unbelievable p political influence was used to kill the project. Nothing happened prior to Minneapolis Let, let me approval. state that, and I don't want to argue this point, but I'm being advised that what you just said was factually incorrect as to, po as, as to the time and when this issue became uh, re came a, a, a reopened issue, but if I'm to accept what you're saying, the local congressman, the state legislator representing the area, the attorney general, uh, all were part of a conspiracy then to come out against your proposal at a particular time when before you didn't think they were against it. No. And you're no. still not sure whether the Governor Thompson was ever against it. What I am saying is, I'm not saying there was a conspiracy against us. I am saying that there was a massive lobbying and misinformation campaign that was, that was uh, produced against us. And it was the result of that massive campaign, where incidentally Patrick O'Connor also in his diary says that he met with Terry McAuliffe about this project. But it was during that time that the opposition pulled out every plug in their attempt to stop the casino from coming into being. And when did you have your lobbyists working on it? Same time? No, our lobbyists started working at the, probably the end of April. And our, there was a difference in the quality of the lobbying work that was being done. Now you live in Florida, we, excuse me, you live in Florida and you gave a contribution to Governor Thompson. Yes. Uh, uh, was that because you were hoping that he'd be open to your views on this issue? No, I happen to agree with a lot of Governor Thompson's uh, political views. I've given contributions to people in Nevada. I've given contributions to people in California. Mm -hmm. I gave a contribution to Senator Cranston in California. I've given contributions in, in various other states because I believe in what those people are saying. And sometimes they can help you. I, and, and most of those, they really cannot help me. It's very rare those that they Those were the can smaller contributions. Pardon? No. Those were the smaller. Thank you. Uh, my time is up. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from California. Since Mr. Cox had taken his five minutes, uh, I'll yield to Mr. Lantos. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Havenick, I read your testimony, which you gave under oath. I would like to ask you to turn to page two, paragraph three. And I want to give you an opportunity to either explain it or to take it back. <clears throat> oh, I, I have a different page two than you. Page two. Uh, no, but I have a, a bigger. All right, but let me read then the, the statement. Could, could you start from your, the, the uh, first sentence, I'll find it. The first sentence of the paragraph says, it is important to stress. Okay, may I read the relevant statement and then ask you to either explain or retract. All decisions on management would be controlled by the tribes. Do you really want this committee to believe that you as an experienced gambling operator would turn over all management decisions to these three ill-equipped tribes to make all management decisions? We did not think that, number one, that the tribes were ill-equipped partners. Well, yes, we, yes we, we were prepared so you, to turn it you over So you considered them. yourself a silent partner in this whole venture? No. Since, oh, allow me to finish. Since you are, your testimony under oath is that all decisions on management would be controlled by the tribes. That is what you written testimony says. All, it should say all decisions on management could be controlled by no, the tribes. No, it said would be controlled by no. the tribes. Please read it. Okay. The could you read it in your own text? I want you to read it now because you changed it for that, me. That, that is correct. The could you read it, please? Um, all, all decisions on management would be controlled by the tribes. Do, that is do you really Do you really expect anybody above the age of six to believe that you, a multi-state gambling operator who must have some profitable operations, because this surely was an unprofitable operations, would turn over all management decisions to these three tribes. That, That's what you are testifying to. That is what I am testifying to, and okay. that is the truth. Well, I'm, I'm and that is what we were prepared to I, do. I understand. Now, let me sort of walk you through the transaction in layman's terms. You invested $40 million in a facility. And the moment it opened, it started losing money. And the losses ran as high as $7 million per annum. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. Now, if I may direct you to your own written testimony again where I, I find another remarkable statement. Uh, this is paragraph one, two, three, four, five, six. Paragraph six. Um, on what page? On now page two also? Page two on oh, No, I have one. You have a copy of it, good. Page two, line four. The existing debt on the track, about $40 million, would be paid by the partnership. Now the partnership involves the Indian tribes. Wait a minute. In addition, the same partnership would own and operate the parking lot, though this land would not be placed in trust. Why not? Okay, the, wait, I don't, I, don't, I don't have that in the same page. Well, I'm just page. reading from your no, testimony. He said page two. Wait a minute. Yes, page two. Top paragraph. Top paragraph. Here it is. Oh, the top, okay. The existing debt on the track, about $40 million, would be paid by the partnership. See, you built this facility for $40 million. It's yes. a white elephant. It's losing you $7 million a year. So you now want to recapture your investment. You bring in these tribes that have no resources. You testified to that. They haven't got a dime. But they will now be responsible for repaying the $40 million. No, no, uh, they are not responsible for paying, repaying the $40 million. No? The entity would be responsible for paying the well, $40 million. But you million. see, without them, you have no entity. And what you but, are but saying is, it's such a phony deal. It, it reeks of phoniness. In, in you have a facility which is losing $7 million a year. You pull in the Indians, 
so you can have a Las Vegas type casino gambling. Hopefully now it will make money and it will pay off the $40 million. And you have the audacity to state in your sworn statement that you are not making any money on it. You are, you are recapturing the investment which you lost by your poor decision. No, no. We, there is a $40 million debt on the facility which would be paid. For which you are responsible before you make the deal. For which we are, and for which we are responsible solely after we make the deal. Only we are responsible as guarantors of that after the deal is made. We bring the tribes into this partnership. The partnership operates the casino. When the casino is operating, there is a payment that is made to each of the three tribes first. The second payment that is made is to the bank, and the third would be a distribution of what is left among the partners. The gentleman's time has expired. But there's no direct obligation on the tribe. It's the ultimate ripoff of Indian tribes. That's what this is. I thank the gentleman from California. Now yield to Mr. Mike. May, may, may I just respond to that, uh, please? The witness can briefly respond. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I know that you believe that what you're saying is the truth, but the facts that you're relying on are really incorrect. Those are your we, facts. No, we were looking to rip off nobody. If somebody looks at this under a microscope, and we are prepared to discuss this with anyone, no one is being ripped off. This is a fair and equal agreement among all of us, and it's really unfair to cast it in any other way because that is not a true reading of the facts. But there's one other thing that I think is very important here. Even if it were unfair, which it isn't, that is the function of the NIGC. That is not the function of the Interior Department at this point because it was that Interior Department that let many bad deals go through for the tribes. But we, this was a very good deal. I believe it was a very good deal when I came in here. And you, no matter what you say, this was a very good deal. And, and you are misinterpreting the facts. Mr. Micah. Thank you. Mr. Havnick, uh, it's not going to do you any good to try to explain that, because uh, most of the members of the panel from the other side haven't been in business. And they wouldn't understand that when you're mm -hmm. losing money in an operation, you try to find a way to make money to make it profitable. It's far and above their ability to comprehend that. So, and um, you're lucky you you got you were only called what an Indian bully, buller. Yes. Today, uh, you're very fortunate. There have been some other uh, terms used uh, here to describe our witnesses. I won't go into, but basically. You're in business. Now, I want to also preface my questions with the point that I don't support casino gambling. I come from Florida. I've tried to oppose it. I've worked against uh, having a casino in my backyard or anywhere in Florida for that uh, matter. I just, it's my personal opinion. But you are in business to do what? To, to make? To make money. Oh, okay. Well, it's a shocking revelation. And, and what you try to do then is to look at a, uh, an operation that doesn't make money and make it profitable. Uh, did you drag any of these Indians kicking and screaming to sign this agreement against their will? No. And they would have made money if you had made money. Is that correct? They would have made a lot of money. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the other thing, too, is you testified that you followed all the laws. Actually, I wasn't here. They, some of the folks that are giving you a hard time actually voted for this legislation, uh, which I would have voted against, uh, incidentally. But you followed all the laws. You hired the expertise, dotted the I's. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. And I think the, uh, in answer to my question, the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, Indian tribe said they did the same. And then you found out uh, that, in fact, that you went through this process and you left off at November of 1994, that everything was submitted uh, in proper form. There were no objections at that time, substantial objections. That is correct. And then what took place? Um, after the approval of the regional yes. office. Bring me up to the point to the uh, August 15th uh, meeting when you found out from 
uh, Mr. McAuliffe that you were going to get hosed. Okay, no, no, we had, we had November, already from been no hosed. Okay. From November? November 15th, right. the, uh, the, the uh, regional office recommended that the land be taken into trust. And they then sent their recommendation to the uh, Department of the Interior in Washington. We called the Department of the Interior, just calling and asking a question, how long will it take to get this uh, final approval out of Washington? In the past, there had never been an overturning of a regional office recommendation. So the thought of, any of it being overturned never really entered into our mind. In the past, there had never been an overturning? This was the first time one of these regional office recommendations had been overturned. What then happened was, in January, we started wondering, you know, like, what's happening? And in February, we were wondering about, you know, what is taking so long, and it was attributed to the bureaucracy in Washington. So we said, oh, well, you know, maybe there's a bureaucracy in Washington. In March, in the middle of March of 1995, Chairman Ackley was in Washington, and he was informed at that point that the department had reopened the comment period for our application. Now, I'm not sure of this, but I don't think that one of those had ever been reopened before either. I think this was the first time that there had been so it had a reopening. Been re it was supposed to be finalized and then it was reopened. Yes, because all, what Washington was supposed to do was to review the findings of the Minneapolis office. We received a 40-page extensive uh, uh, study of what we had proposed, and they went through all of the various IGRA related things and they approved it and generally every other time Washington so just stamped it. when was the it. first time you heard of the political influence? In the middle of March in 1995. At that point? Yes. At that point we heard of the political influence but the tribe sent a letter and they were told that that comment period would end in April. And you April testified 30th. that unbelievable amounts of money and political influence were used. Could you describe those for the committee? Yes. The, um, the opposition, which uh, included Patrick O'Connor, who was a very high-powered lobbyist, went around and through their a web of people in both the state of Wisconsin and in Washington, lobbied any public official from the city of Hudson to the state legislature to Congress about this project. Prior to this happening, there was virtually no interest in the federal, at the federal level in what happened in Hudson, Wisconsin on the, on the dog track application. They also had a continual barrage of the people at the uh, Department of the Interior to change the opinion, change the opinion. And really what, what they were doing was, the, the entire campaign was forget the law, forget the facts. Forget that there's IGRA. Forget that you have a fiduciary responsibility to the tribes. Rule in favor of our clients. All that is important is that our clients get their desired result. And they used any way that they could in order to do that, even attempting to uh, cast dispersions on us, my family, our company. There, there were no limits to what they did to kill this project. But the whole thrust of it was forget IGRA, forget the law, forget the facts, give my clients what they want. And no one was immune to that lobbying and uh, propaganda effort. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Havnick, you've testified several times that this was the first time that a regional office or a local office decision had been overturned. Uh, and you may be correct, I don't know, but I'm, I've got before me uh, a denial by the Bush administration of the Santee Sioux Tribes application. Are you familiar with this case? No, I'm not. Okay, let me just take a minute and, and maybe I can help you with this one because all we'd have to do is change the names and I think it would be quite, quite similar. Uh, in this case, the tribe in partnership with Harvey's Resort Hotel Casino would purchase certain property in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and has requested the three acres of the property be placed in trust for the tribe. Documents indicate this is a, an excellent economic development proposal for the Santee Sioux. However, the Sac and Fox tribes, the governor of Iowa, and members of the affected community 
have stated their strong opposition to the project. After several meetings and consultations between and among representatives of the Santee Sioux Tribe, Harvey's Resort Hotel Casino, Central Office Bureau of Indian Affairs officials, and myself, I have decided to deny the request for approval of the land acquisition. The proposed venture would place the Santee Sioux a Nebraska tribe in direct competition with the tribes in Iowa, um, and goes on and on. But, but, but that was, but that, first of all, they crossed state lines, but in addition to that. As we have here with but the Minnesota there, tribe. But, but there was not a recommendation from whatever regional office, which I would assume would be Minneapolis, approving the project. I they think that there was. I see heads going up and down. Am, am I correct in saying that the regional office recommended that this be approved? Okay, but this was across state lines. As was the one here. You've objected to the Minnesota. No, no, no. This was Wisconsin tribes applying in Hudson. Okay. The tribes were not brought in from another state. They were indigenous okay. Wisconsin okay. tribes. Okay, but so there's a difference. But, but again, I, I'm saying that this, this shows that this was not totally unprecedented, that this was done under the Bush administration. I don't know that anybody's uh, talking about it. But let me move on, and, and I'll give you a chance to. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... Why do you think the tribes opposing the casino contributed to the DNC? I'm sorry. Uh, would you Why do you think that the tribes opposing the casino contributed to the DNC? That's the whole reason we're here today. Because the tribes wanted to protect their monopoly. Okay. So they were doing something nefarious. Yes. And why did you contribute to Governor Thompson? Because I believe in what Governor Thompson says. I happen to believe in a lot of his programs. I'd like them to be administered in Florida. I think Governor Thompson is a fine politician and I agree with him. And, okay, and but I, I was not trying to get Governor Thompson to change anything. Is, These people were asking that the people who got the contributions from them, that they were asking them to ignore the law, ignore IGRA, forget the facts, and rule in their favor. But of course, Governor Thompson has the final say in this. Yes, he You're does. You're aware of that. I am very and, aware of it. July 6, 1990, you contributed 3,500. Does that sound right, Barbara? Is Barbara your wife? Barbara is my wife. She contributed 5,000. Pardon me. 5,000 that day. Does that sound right? It could be. Florence, who's, who's my mother-in-law. Your mother-in-law. She contributed 5,000. Mm -hmm. So $13,500. When was the date? July 6, 1990. And not, yes. Uh, this this project began in 1993. I'm, I'm well aware of that. Uh, 1991, $500 to Governor Thompson, $2,500 to Governor Thompson on November 8, 1991, $500 May 21st, 1993. Uh, there are several other Hecht named Marlene Hecht. Is that a relation to you or your wife? Marlene, Marlene Hecht? Hecht? No. Florence William? Hecht is the only okay. relationship. Um, uh, again, this reminds me of when I was first running for Congress and, and a group asked me what my definition of a uh, special interest was. Uh, and I said, it's someone who contributes to my opponent. Uh, because I think everybody in this room believes that their motives, and I, and I think you're sincere. I think you think Governor Thompson's a very good governor. But nobody in this room is ignorant of the fact that Governor Thompson had the last say on this issue. And after the testimony today, no one appears to be ignorant of the fact that Governor Thompson appeared at some times to be saying one thing and sometimes to saying another thing. What is your understanding of what Governor Thompson was going to well, do? I, I'd like to say, just say two things. In okay. 1990, when the, when the bulk of the contributions were made to Governor Thompson, this issue was not even on the horizon. I understand that. Because the Indian gaming didn't begin until 1991. And if we could have foreseen that what happened would have happened, we would have acted very, very differently. So there was no attempt on our part to influence Governor but it's Thompson. Clear, it is clear that you have contributed, you and your family members, yes, probably $20,000. Yes, we have. And, and have you had meetings with Governor Thompson to discuss this proposal? Yes. And what has he told you? He has told us that uh, he is, you know, I don't open know. to see, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Okay. I believe that Governor Thompson is open to see what happens. And so okay, that uh, Governor his Thompson letter. continues to say that he is opposed to the expansion of gaming, but there has not been a definition of what constitutes expansion. And we contend that this is not an expansion, this is a contraction. Okay, let me move on. When you hired Mr. Eckstein, I bet you were one happy guy. Um, did he tell you what kind of access he had to Secretary Babbitt? I wasn't one happy guy, okay? We were one very unhappy people because we felt that what was being done to us was that the tribes that were against us 
were making enormous amounts of money every day that this project was delayed. So we felt that what they were trying to do was since you couldn't kill it on the merits, they were just going to never give us a decision. But clearly you hired Mr. Eckstein because you thought he was a man who had special act access to we the Secretary We felt that Mr. Eckstein could get this project back on track. You felt he, he had special access. Did, did you yes, think he had did. special access? Yes, we did. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'm going to take uh, my five minutes, but I'm only going to take one minute. I'm going to yield to my colleague from Indiana so that I don't uh, keep him waiting. I just want to <coughs> restate what I said a while ago. The law requires consultation with the tribes. This tribe, because it was a poor tribe, was not consulted with. That is correct. Uh, the tribes that had a vested interest in stopping this, uh, this agreement uh, that was making $400,000 for every man, woman, and child in the tribe lobbied, went to a private meeting with lobbyists, with members of the, uh, with members of the Department of the Interior, and those who should have been uh, at that meeting or at meetings with them to talk about the problems were not. And that was a violation of the law. Tribal meetings that were held uh, the, were with these major contributors. And then after these meetings took place and after the application was de denied, $350,000, not, not $500 or 1000 or 2500 but $350,000 was given to the DNC. And then the top lawyer at the Department of Interior and the chief of staff at the Department of the Interior go to work for the rich Indian tribe. And then Mr. Collier, one of the two people I just mentioned, carries a fifty to $100,000 check over to the DNC from the rich tribe. Now, I understand what my colleague's trying to do. He's trying to equate your contributions with what's happened, but I think it's 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 ridiculous on the face of it, because I don't th think you can compare what happened if you look at that scheme or that series of events with uh, with what you were trying to do. And once again, I want to state uh, my opposition to legalized gambling. But nevertheless, we're not talking about the day. We're talking about uh, illegal use of campaign financing, uh, campaign finances to try to influence policy at the. Uh, Interior Department. I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Indiana. May, may I just uh, make one comment, if I could, sir? If you uh, turn to Exhibit 302, which is a letter to uh, Chairman Ackley, and look at the last paragraph, it's from John Duffy. The date of that is March 27, 1995. And that letter was sent after our applicant tribes found out that the comment period had been reopened. And in that, John Duffy in the last paragraph says, please be assured that our commitment regarding the submission of additional information will not delay consideration of other aspects of your application by the BIA's Indian Gaming Management staff. Should areas of concern with the application be identified, you will be so notified, and we never were. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Here we aren't just talking about what looks like at least the attempt to buy influence, but successfully buying influence, where you have a former treasurer of the Democratic National Committee repeating the Delaware North charge, which the current finance chairman of the President of the United States repeats to you, where you have a Democratic national leader like Don Fowler, you have as the other things that uh, the chairman and we're looking as to whether influence was actually bought not whether there are attempts to buy it. Quite frankly, I think this demonstrates a lot of the evils of gambling and the evils of power of concentration in government, because this is what happens when major I would concur with the made, gentleman. That major decisions are made that can then be corrupted by money pouring into both sides, and the dangers of, of, of gambling are inherent. At the state level, it's corrupting state government as well as the federal government. Nevertheless, we are here looking at whether, in fact, our government has been corrupted. Uh, in the question of the St. Troy Croix tribe. I wanted to get in. I, I got a little confused in the original proposal. It was um,
agreement vis-a-vis -vis the bank for loan purposes? Yes. Um, because, in effect, you weren't doing this as a charitable operation for the Indian tribes. You were in a business arrangement, but you were in a business arrangement with somebody whose only collateral was the Indian contract. They had no cash in any way and no property. That is correct. Um, that when you switched from the St. Croix tribe to the other Indian tribes, did you anticipate the St. Croix tribe would turn and oppose you? Uh, we thought that they might, yes. Um, and so it wasn't just a money deal because certainly since you've been turned down, since you spent thousands of dollars and other things, the difference in 5% is not that significant. No, not relative to whether you get it or you don't get it. That's really the key. Do you believe you would have you expressed concerns that might have bogged down your dog racing elsewhere? Do you believe you would have gotten it because at the time the referendum had passed in Hudson and it would have been smooth sailing if you'd have cut the deal with the St. Croix tribe right in the beginning? Probably, because it would have just sailed right through. Did you anticipate the opposition as a businessman? You may have run into this in dog racing and other places. Did you anticipate the opposition and the intense opposition of the Minnesota tribes? No. Why not? Why did we not anticipate that? Because at the time that this was really happening, the Minnesota tribes were also having problems with their management companies. So most of these tribes were so preoccupied with their own internal affairs that they weren't worried about any external affairs. It really wasn't until the end of 1994 that they were in a position where they could start fighting against this. They, they weren't focused on us at the time. Okay, but we did anticipate that there would be some opposition, yes, but we didn't think it would take on the character that it did. Thank you. My, my time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana will be next in line if he so chooses. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Gonna, I'm recognized for five minutes, but I'm not going to take the full five minutes. I'd like to put on the board the chart the chairman just had on the board saying Hudson facts uh, on the screen and his Hudson facts says law requires consultation with the tribes. Lobbyists were hired to stop progress. Tribal meetings with big contributors, $400,000 opponents versus 6,000 proponents, 350,000 contributions to Democrats, Duffy and Collier leave Interior to work for uh, Shakopee's. Collier carried $50,000 check to DNC on behalf of Shakopee's. And the chairman said, even a blind person can see there's something wrong. Something's wrong with this. Well, I want to put up something else called tobacco facts. And I want to read from this. The tobacco industry hires former Republican National Committee Chairman Haley Barber as their lobbyist. Tobacco industry gives $8.8 .8 million to the Republican Party since 1995. The three biggest contributors to the Republican Party were all tobacco companies. Speaker Gingrich and Senate Majority Leader Lott insert a secret provision into the budget bill that gives the tobacco industry a $50 billion tax break. With no discussion on the merits, the largest special interest tax break in history is passed. Now, I I raise this issue because look at the, what this committee is ignoring, not what it's, looking, what it's reviewing, but what it's ignoring when we talk about the influence of money, special interest decision making by elected officials who receive contributions. I don't know about this case. I'm open to hearing all sides on it. I'm not convinced uh, that uh, these Hudson facts are accurate and that they were the determining influence, but I am convinced that these tobacco facts are accurate and that the money from the tobacco industry dictated the result of a $50 billion giveaway led by the Republican leaders who received the money. My question is, and, I, and I've said it in the past and I'm going to say it again, why aren't we looking at something like that? And the reason we're not is because this committee's investigation is not to be taken seriously because it is all partisan. It's all partisan political. And the uh, only purpose of this investigation is not to get to the facts about campaign abuses, but to try to uh, smear Democrats, as sometimes with some information uh, that uh, sounds like it might have some credibility, oftentimes with information that's fabricated. I want to yield now the rest of my time, and of course he'll have time if he wants on his own, to Mr. Kucinich to uh, question the witness. Uh, if I could say at the outset, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Waxman, 
that in uh, sitting in on the many hours of testimony today, I think the uh, American people have to see these proceedings as further proof of the need for a broad-based campaign finance reform. When we are here and uh, listen to the amount of money that goes into the political process, just from one witness, to try to, um, whether it's for the purposes of giving money to nice people because you like them, or giving money to people who are in positions of power because they can make decisions on your behalf, the fact of the matter is that the American people are not really enjoying the same kind of benefits that go to people in positions of power in the business community and other areas. So, I, I, and that, and that uh, you know, we can't proceed further unless we recognize there are 187 signatures on a petition right now in the House to release campaign finance legislation and give the House a chance to vote on it. These hearings prove the need for that. You know, a businessman who's a, you, sir, I'm sure you're a very honorable person and, and probably a very good businessman. And I could imagine that a very good businessman who is also an honorable person might be a little bit perplexed if he gets about $50,000 of his money and can't get a decision in his favor. I'm sure that's a shock to you. Uh, but the American people who do not contribute uh, money to campaigns because they may not have that kind of money, they worry about getting decisions in their favor, too. So you know how, how the people of this country may feel. Now, I'd like to go on to some uh, questions Can, can I just uh, say one thing, uh, please, I, sir? I, I have some questions I'd like to ask. Uh, can, I, can I just Mr. answer one thing that you said, please, sir? Okay, of course. I'd, you know, the gentleman's uh, certainly free to respond. Uh, we, did, we, we did not give $50,000 to anybody to influence this decision. We didn't give $1 to anyone to influence this decision. I, I, heard, you, I heard you testify uh, when Mr. Um, Barrett's questions that your total contributions to the political system may have totaled about 50,000. Since 19, if I, from if I might just reclaim my time, how can you be so pure to tell us that you gave money and you did it for noble purposes, but when somebody else gives money and they advocate a position contrary to yours, they must have done it for nefari nefarious no, that, purposes. That's not what I I've find said. that very troubling I and a little disingenuous. But I feel that the Mr. other Mr. side Waxman gave you know? the money to have people disregard the law. There is a difference. I you believe gave money and I you got to meet with the governor. You gave money to a lobbyist who got to meet with the Secretary of Interior. Ordinary people don't I, get that I never met the Secretary of the Interior. But but people, Your lobbyists I, did. Pardon me? Your lobbyists met with the Secretary he did, of the Interior. But, but I, I don't believe that people shouldn't have the right to lobby people. But I am How saying about to, to contribute you, to them? I think they have a right to contribute to people. But I am saying that it is the quality of the lobbying that was done in this case that produced a grievous wrong. This is not ordinary lobbying. This is not just trying to get somebody to hear my case. This is telling somebody, ignore IGRA, ignore the law, ignore the facts. It's a very different kind of thing. And you lost, and you don't like it. Gentlemen, time in. A gentleman from Indiana has uh, five minutes on his own time now. I, do. I believe one of the greatest uh, hungers in America right now is for integrity, and they don't see it out of public officials or a lot of times in private business or in, in a lot of different places. And, and uh, one of the things as we look at campaign finance reform and what this committee is trying to do is rule number one is, is if you can't follow the current laws, what good will it do to pass new laws? Because if you don't have people of integrity and if you have people who are going to bend it and abuse it, it won't do us any good to pass more laws. Now, I happen to be willing to speak out against my own party, as I did on the tobacco, because I don't understand how that got in the bill. I don't understand why we weren't told. And our leadership ought to be rebuked when they do that, too. And that is not the jurisdiction of this committee, but it's something that should be looked at. I believe that, in, in general, we probably need to look at various kinds. I sponsored a number of bills, but any type of finance reform we have to look at needs to include not only the business side, but the labor side, the soft money, and what we do with millionaires and billionaires who decide they're going to dump all their money in right now that's constitutionally protected. This is not an easy issue to answer, but what we're looking at is following the current law and whether, in fact, it has been abused from calls from the White House to Air Force One and back to the White House. Was that just nominal checking, or was it trying to bully? Were there decisions made by staffers under Secretary Babbitt in, in return for them getting a future job? The Secretary has admitted he's lied. We just don't know which ones are lied. This is serious stuff, 
and being trivialized for political purposes is wrong. It's not about gambling. I'm more than happy to have hearings on gambling because I oppose gambling. I oppose dog racing and I oppose casinos. But what we're trying to sort out here is what happened in this process. One of the things that's really interesting to me is why a former treasurer of the Democratic National Committee, Patrick O'Connor, put out letters saying that you were part of Delaware North. And then a Patrick or Terry McAuliffe down in Florida used the same charge to you that it was Delaware North. Why did they think you were Delaware North or that that dog track was? I have, I have no idea why they Is would. Is Delaware North a, a fairly sizable organization? Uh, I, in one of well, the memos, there, there's a reference in, to them being in, tied to in the, the Pat model. In the Patrick O'Connor letter, the original Patrick O'Connor letter of uh, either April or May of 1995, Patrick O'Connor said that we were Delaware North and that you know that Delaware North is very close to Senator Alphonse D'Amato, who I think is a very fine man, but I've never met. And you know how, the, I believe, the President feels about Alphonse D'Amato or how we feel about Alphonse D'Amato. So the point of tying Delaware North into this was to say that we were a Republican company that was seeking this transfer of the land into trust. That was in one Patrick O'Connor letter. There's another Patrick O'Connor letter, which is your exhibit 334. And um, if you would turn to the second paragraph there, it says, unquestionably, tribal governments will need to call upon the Clinton administration and the president himself to assert leadership, leadership and assist tribes through the difficult 1996 budget process and to help fend off attacks on tribal gaming. As witnessed in the fight to stop the Hudson Dog Track proposal, the Office of the President can and will work on our behalf when asked to do so. The now, Delaware North charge come up anywhere other than those two Patrick O'Connor letters? Yes. Oh, where else? It, it came up with Senator McCain. How did it come up with Senator McCain? The, uh, the lobbyists against us said that we were Delaware North. And De Delaware North had, uh, there was a, uh, Delaware North had had a, a checkered past. And there was an incident in Arizona that involved a predecessor company to Delaware North. Senator McCain coming from Arizona would be particularly sensitive to that issue. So hearing that Delaware North was involved in this would get an extremely negative reaction out of Senator McCain towards us. The, um, do you know, and you're testifying under oath, because we'll be able to ask Patrick O'Connor, that when we ask him why he was floating this, you don't know where it came from. There's nobody associated with you in any of your other business events, investments and so on that's with Delaware North. The reason this is important is it looks to me like Terry McAuliffe got his information from Patrick O'Connor. He probably did. I, uh, there is nothing, first, there is nothing in our business associations that in any way tie us to Delaware North other than that Delaware North, in our opinion, is a fine company who is involved in Greyhound racing also, among other things, and we do belong to an association, a trade association, with them. We have no business relationships with Delaware North. But, um, there was a definite attempt to say that this was Delaware North. Delaware North also owns two dog tracks in Wisconsin. So there was a way to muddy the waters as to who the real owner was, except for the fact that all the people had to do was contact Madison and get a list of the owners. Because if Terry McAuliffe got it from Patrick O'Connor, it proves that muddying the water worked pretty well. In other words, by tying it in with D'Amato and putting a political angle to this, it was rattling around at the very least, and we'll get this more out, but rallying around among very top officials, the finance director for the President of the United States is picking up scuttlebutt, not based on fact, probably because they played this as a political case. It, it helped overturn a regional decision of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and got people to disregard the facts, disregard the law, and rule for the other side. It was very important. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, again, from the uh, standpoint of trying to take an overview of some of the things that have transpired here today, I will again insist that we ought to start considering the implications of campaign finance just based on the testimony 
today, the need for reform. Um, I want to tell the chairman, Mr. Burton, uh, when you presented your Hudson facts, uh, one of the things that we know is a matter of fact, uh, number five, with respect to people who left Interior to work for uh, Shakopee's, I want you to know that bothers me. I look at that and I say, there's something wrong there. Um, we spend a lot of time, though, in these hearings trying to prove that uh, people are bad. But uh, people actually may be decent people, but the system is bad. People are uh, people thinking that they have to buy access. That's wrong. And people trying to um, to buy access. That's wrong. Uh, decision making that would be based on contributions. That's wrong and illegal. And people working for the government one day and then turning around and uh, uh, working for groups that uh, uh, are working for a company that would be regulated the next day uh, by them previously. That's wrong. Um, so it should be said that there are those of us who are aware that there's something wrong with the system. We're charged to get to the facts of the particular matter that's before us. Uh, Mr. Havanick, you have uh, um, testified today that I think it was on August 15th of 1995 that Mr. McAuliffe uh, made some uh, remarks to you that this committee could only take to mean that somehow there was an awareness in the, uh, uh, within the fundraising machinery of, of, uh, uh, of a decision-making process that was and should have been the sole province of of an administrative body in the federal government. Uh, when you learned that, the day that you learned that, the day that he told you that, did you tell anyone else? Yes, I did. Told who Mr. did you tell? Mr. Freebert. And who, who else did you tell? Uh, he was the only one. Did you make a decision uh, not to mention at any other time to anyone when you first told him, did you decide you couldn't mention that at, to anyone at any time you're going to save that information? No, I had also told that to Mr. Goff, Mark Goff, that I knew that. Mark Goff is who again? Mark Goff is a, uh, a political consultant who works with us, public relations person. <coughs> but, but earlier, you and your attorney both stated, if I'm correct, that you did not mention this conversation you supposedly had with Mr. McAuliffe in your uh, litigation against the Department of Interior because you wanted to save it up for its surprise value. Is that correct? No, uh, originally, I, 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 he was so in shock by what happened, and I was so in shock by what happened, and I knew that there were serious errors that came to get to this <coughs> terrible decision, that I wanted to see if he was, was going to try and do anything or direct me as to what we should do next. But, but didn't you really decide to save this? I mean, it, we're, we're here, we're two, almost two and a half years later, where we are in committee. I just heard this for the first time. So did you, was, and you testify there's some strategic worth to just kind of saving this fact and bring it out at a certain time? To bring it, we have, on September 15th, 1995, which was one month later, right. we filed the first lawsuit. And at that point, the, stra the strategic decision was made not to do anything at that time, okay, that it was not the proper time to use that information. Is it not true that in June of 1995, Judge Crabb in Wisconsin ruled against your side in various way, ways in a published decision, giving the Department of Interior a significant victory at the time by denying your motion for summary judgment and by granting a protective order to the department? Th that's, that is 1996, but it's correct. It's 96? Okay. Yes. Uh, that was an important decision, was it not? Yes. And are you, uh, and you and your side, uh, were not particularly happy with that decision, I take it? No, we were not. Uh, you moved to get that order reconsidered? We did. Now, in moving for reconsideration, your side filed new documents, including affidavits, to try to get the judge to reconsider a decision. We did. And the lawyers were trying to show Judge Crabb that the department had been corrupt, were they not? Yes. And, but you still did not testify as to your conversation with uh, Mr. McAuliffe when your side moved for reconsideration. That's correct. And you still say that your side decided to save your story about Mr. McAuliffe, 
even though you were trying to get the judge to reconsider her opinion. That is correct. Now, uh, Mr. Havenick, I know that when lawyers are trying to get a judge to reconsider a uh, major decision, they provide all the evidence they can that the decision was wrong. I, I find it very unusual for uh, a, a lawyer in such a significant case to save up evidence when they're filing such an important motion. And I find it very unusual that uh, this uh, story about Mr. McAuliffe surfaces today, even though it never came up in what could only be described as very contentious litigation with the department when you were trying to uh, get the judge to reconsider uh, her decision for the department. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would. There are three lawsuits that are currently uh, happening because of this uh, grievous wrong. The first is in the federal court. The second is a state lawsuit. And the third is a slander suit that we have filed against the O'Connor law firm for uh, alleging that we are mob-related <coughs> family people. In the state lawsuit, we uncovered a tremendous amount of information that was then presented to Justice Crabb. The, we were never given the opportunity to take the deposition of Terry McAuliffe. At the time that that deposition would have been taken or will be taken, it was intended that the information would be used at that time. Isn't it possible, though, if I, you know, isn't it possible that had your publicist released this information publicly, it would have created such an uproar that there would have been no way that your, uh, your bid could have been uh, easily dismissed? We have a tremendous amount of difficulty in the federal lawsuit because we really don't know who the Justice Department is representing. I think that they should be representing me as an American citizen. I don't think that they're doing that in this case. The Justice Department is defending people who we feel did wrong. But we, what we gave to Justice Crabb that, uh, that was a result of the state lawsuit was sufficient for her to come out with her ruling in March of 1997 in which she found that there was evidence of political maneuvering or whatever in the outcome of this event. So what we presented to her was enough. But we are very, very suspicious of what the position of the Justice Department is in the federal lawsuit. Because are they defending me as an American citizen, forgetting that we're part of the plaintiffs? Are they defending people who are alleged to have done something wrong, who are employees of the Interior Department? We're really not sure what side they're on. Are there and any, we uh, have got to be careful with what we do with information that we have, because we don't know who's on what side. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, I'll wrap this up. I know you've been very generous, and I thank you. Um, is, are there any other, this McAuliffe uh, revelation today is kind of a surprise. Are there any other surprises that you've been saving that might be helpful to bring forward right now so that we can get a better uh, understanding of what kind of case you're bringing before this Congress? I, I don't mean to belittle this, but this is not a surprise party, but that would really be part well, of it. if you're enjoying it, I hope you I'm are. I'm really not, but it would be part of the work product of that federal lawsuit, which is extremely okay. important to us. I, I just f thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I, I think these hearings do have use and value, and I thank the gentleman for taking his time to bring this information to this committee. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Snowbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, Yes, first of all, l let me respond to the remarks of my friend from Ohio when he suggested that uh, we have a terrible system out there and, and the implication was that uh, when things go bad, the system makes us do it. And I think we still have some personal responsibility and accountability for what we do and, and uh, I think we are excusing people much too easily if we say the system made them do it. The other thing I'd, I'd want to point out, I, I noticed my, uh, my friend Mr. Micah and, and Mr. Souter also uh, prefaced their remarks. Um, I am no uh, proponent of gambling. As a matter of fact, in the 12 years of the Kansas State Legislature, I've gained quite a reputation. You can go back and talk to your, your uh, industry group about that. Um, but again, as they mentioned, that's not the issue here. I am also an opponent of political corruption, and I'm also an opponent of that corruption being used uh, and using the system to uh, improperly influence decisions. I want to follow up on, on the letter that uh, you were handed by 
uh, Mr. Barrett when he was doing some questioning had to do with the uh, Nebraska tribe who was uh, looking for trust land in, in Iowa. And part of that letter indicates that um, uh, that IGRA would require the concurrence of the governor of Iowa for any such acquisition. That refers to the fact that uh, a governor basically has a veto power over whether or not trust land or, or land within his state can be taken into trust. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, <clears throat> to your knowledge, uh, in your case, has Governor Thompson ever communicated his willingness or his opposition to uh, placing this land around Hudson uh, in trust? No, he has not. We have never gotten the approval out of Washington, and the governor is the next step. So he's never been asked directly what the answer is. And I really don't think he should have to answer the question until he's presented with it. Well, apparently, they were asking for differences in the cases, and apparently the governor in Iowa had already indicated his unwillingness to place that land in trust, which gave them uh, a reason to deny this application. Mm -hmm. Again, you haven't reached the, the stage where uh, the governor's head uh, of Wisconsin has been put in that position. But, no, sir. Uh, Will the gentleman yield for a moment, please? I yield. Just, again, I think that there's some, some uncertainty about this. I, I've read three times a letter that I felt was pretty unequivocal in the governor's opposition, well, and I recognize, my time, what I recognize I there's a dispute of that. Reclaiming my time, what I had asked was whether there is anything in the record anywhere about the governor's willingness or opposition, and the answer was no, and that differs from this case in that the governor of Iowa had expressed opposition and was unwilling to place that land in trust, so there, there is a distinction between the two. I'd like to follow up a little bit uh, on, on the uh, discussion about uh, your conversation with Terry McAuliffe. I note, and I think it's rather ironic, that, that you met Mr. McAuliffe uh, at the time of this conversation uh, at a fundraising event in, in Florida. Do you yes. recall what that fundraising event was for? Yes, it was the Clinton-Gore re-election campaign. Did you make a contribution to attend the event? Yes. All right, I'll leave it at that. Uh, let me go on, let me go on and, and ask for some clarification. I, well, I guess, I guess the point being you, you've contributed to Democratic candidates as well as to Governor Thompson and, and other candidates. Uh, Correct. In California, okay. Um, let me follow up on, on one that hasn't been, had much attention here, and that is the uh, December 3rd, 1996 uh, meeting uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, you discussed the fact that, that tribal members were meeting with uh, officials of BIA. Um, First of all, I find that curious. The lawsuit had been filed at that point in time, is that correct? Correct. The, the lawsuit was filed um, 14 months before that, 15 months before that. Uh, did the topic of the lawsuit arise at, at this particular meeting, the no. December 96 meeting? No, I, I don't believe it did. Uh, it, it says in here that you were complaining about the turndown. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to believe you didn't discuss the lawsuit in relation to the turndown. Um, I, I, I don't think we did discuss okay. the lawsuit because I think we were told that we were both litigants, you know, both sides were told that and not, not to get into, um, into the lawsuit. But apparently you did have some conversation with BIA officials about their reasoning or their rationale for turning you down. Yes. At, at, that, at that December 3rd meeting, yes. Right. And it sounds like there may have been some long discussion with uh, disagreement among the parties about what the facts may have, may have been. Is that well, no? There were there were there were other proposals that they were coming with, like drop the lawsuit and start over, and that sort of thing. And you know, we were not going to start over. The, we feel that the case was very strong and the application was very strong in the way in which it was presented, and that was really the gist of what. Uh, Mr. Scabine was coming to try to convince the, the group Four Feathers to do, to start drop the lawsuit and start over. There was no real discussion as to the merits of the lawsuit, but that suggestion was dismissed out of hand, so it never, never went anywhere. Well, did Mr. Scabine leave the impression that if you were to drop the lawsuit and start through the process again, that there would be a better outcome? Uh, well, there was an implication that there could be a better outcome. Um, and yet your, your statement that Mr. or your recollection of the statement that Mr. Scabine uh, made was that uh, basically don't blame me, it was the political people who turned you down. Correct. Was when it went upstairs, don't blame me. When it went upstairs, politics took over. Okay. And, and the implication you said of, his, of, of the whole discussion was that that might not happen to you the next time around? 
Correct. And this is after the November 96 election? Correct. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Sununu. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Eckstein has testified uh, in the Senate that uh, in a meeting with Secretary Babbitt, Secretary Babbitt uh, stated quite clearly to him, uh, I guess his phrase was, do you know how much these uh, opponents of this project have contributed uh, and, and Mr. Eckstein's response was that he didn't know and, and the secretary indicated that it, it was as high as a half a million dollars. Uh, were you aware of that testimony that Mr. Eckstein provided? Yes, I was. Were you aware of that story or had Mr. Eckstein relayed that story to you at any time prior to his giving testimony in the Senate? Yes, he did. Uh, actually, Mr. Eckstein relayed the story to Mark Goff right after his meeting with Mr. Babbitt on July 14th. And Mr. Goff relayed the conversation to me right after his conversation with Mr. Eckstein on July 14th. And, and when was Mr. Goff's conversation with you? On July 14th, right after, within a couple of hours. Literally, of the, immediately, the same Yes, day. yes. So uh, you were aware um, uh, prior to any of the, the, the discussion, the testimony, the subpoenas that have gone on through these committees, you were aware that Mr. Eckstein had, uh, had clearly made that allegation? Yes. Uh, when Mr. McAuliffe uh, said to you um, that he had met with Don Fowler and others and turned this project around, uh, obviously you were surprised. What did you take to mean that he had met with Fowler? Uh, what kind of a discussion did you understand to have taken place? I thought that he had been the conduit who had um, brought together the opposing tribes and their lobbyists with the appropriate parties, and that together they baked the denial. And, and uh, obviously, your, one of your greatest concerns with this denial and, and what you've emphasized in your lawsuit is that uh, as a result of that influence and money being brought to bear, the rules, the regulations, and the laws associated with granting or rejecting this, uh, this permit uh, were not followed, correct? Correct. Um, I direct your attention to Exhibit 335. Uh, it is an analysis of the uh, risks uh, of the litigation. Uh, um, Sakagun, Sakagun, uh, and the rest uh, versus Sakagan. Babbitt. That's one of the, that's the federal case, is that yes, correct? Yes, it is. Um, on page two of that, it states that uh, this is the solicitor uh, writing, analyzing uh, your claim of rules, laws, regulations not being followed. And it states that uh, we've determined that the alleged problems with the Section 2719 process are significant. We're concerned about our ability to show that plaintiffs were told about and given an opportunity to remedy problems, which the department ultimately found were outcome determinative. Area directors are told to give applicants an opportunity to cure problems, and it will be hard to argue persuasively that applicants lose this opportunity once the central office begins its review. Now, as far as we can tell, uh, it seems that you were never given that opportunity to cure problems with the application. Is that correct? That's completely correct. We were never given the opportunity. You referred to a memo uh, that Mr. Duffy had sent that also referred to uh, the right of the, uh, the parties to be given the opportunity to cure defects. Yes, I did. Both cases are, are obviously an attempt to make sure that this is a fair and open process. Is that correct? That is correct. Ultimately, however, you were not successful. Uh, you were not given th this opportunity uh, uh, through the process. Um, Mr. Skabine has said in your conversation that it was a political process from above that caused this uh, to fail. Um, are you familiar with a, uh, a memo of June 8th uh, authored by Mr. Skab Skabine, however, that seems to contradict the final rejection? I believe that's uh, Mr. Hartman's, um, uh, or June 8th is Mr. Hartman's. Uh, I'm referring to that draft. It's the one that's by, stamped signed draft. by Mr. Hartman. Yes. And I'd just like to uh, re-emphasize the conclusion stated right in the, the beginning of the paragraph. 
It says, therefore, the staff recommends, this is the Indian Gaming Management staff at Interior, that the secretary, based on the following, determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Uh, that clearly contradicts the memorandum of July 14th, does it not? Yes, it does. And we also found it strange that if that were just a draft, why was it signed? But that's neither here nor there. I certainly don't have an answer to that. Um, you were not aware that this memorandum was written on or about June 8th, supporting the finding of no detriment to the community? And we were aware. Were you made aware of it when it was written? Um, no, we, no, we were not. You were not made aware of the decision to reject the application or any problems with the application until uh, the June 14th well, decision memo, correct? Uh, we got the July 14th decision memo turning us down. We were never made aware of any problems with the um, application or anything that w was not fixable. When Skabine, uh, Mr. Skabeen indicated that he was uh, turned down or, or forced to back down by political forces, did he uh, did he reference the fact that he had written a memo in support of uh, in support of the application previously? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me briefly state at the outset uh, that I have grave reservations about Indian gaming. Um, I have opposed Indian gaming in Arizona. I believe that. We owe the Native American people of this country a sound economic development, but to place all of our eggs in the basket of Indian gaming, I think, is a mistake. However, this hearing is not about Indian gaming. This hearing is about the process uh, which resulted in the decision turning down your license request. And I have to tell you that I am stunned by um, one particular section of your uh, testimony here, and I want to clarify a part of it. I think the McAuliffe testimony is very interesting, uh, but I want to focus on what you have to say about what Mr. Skabeen said at the December 3, 1996 meeting. That is a meeting um, which occurred long after this decision was made. And first I want to clarify the language. If you look at that language, you have written, finally Mr. Skabeen said, quote, look, don't blame me. And then you, your type statement that I have says, we have it to you. I presume that's a typo and that it should have said, we gave it to you. That is correct. Okay, so for the record, you would like to correct that statement? That's yes. a typo. It should say, we gave it to you. Correct. And then he, you go on to say, and this is a direct quote from Mr. Skabeen, it was the political people who turned you down. Close quote. Correct. Okay, can you first set the stage? Who all was present at that meeting? What was the meeting called for? Okay. Uh, and how did, how did that statement happen to come out? The, uh, the meeting was, there were, Mr. Skabeen was coming up to Wisconsin to meet with all of the Wisconsin tribes, all 11 tribes. Not I understood only, he was bringing good news? He, that he was bringing good news and he was going to have a meeting with our group the day before the big, new, the, the big meeting with all of the tribes and that he was bringing good news with him. What, did, what was the good news to be? <laughs> well, good news is relative, but the good news was that if we started the application all over and we drop the lawsuit that uh, we would probably be looked favorably upon the next time around. Why would Mr. Skabeen consider that good news? Was he generally favorable to this idea? Well, uh, uh, favorable to the idea of starting the application? No, over? generally favorable to allowing you and your partners to have the casino. Uh, in any meeting that I ever attended with Mr. Skabeen, he always was favorable, or at least appeared favorable to me, to this project. Which would be consistent with the memo that uh, my colleagues just questioned you about, which indicated support, written by Mr. Skabeen, indicating support for the casinos. That memo would be completely supportive of every indication that he ever gave me or any of my partners. Um, all right, so he's there, and what leads him to say, under what circumstances does he happen to say, don't blame me, we gave it to you. That sounds like past tense. It was the political people who turned you down. He, when he presented the idea of filing the, the new application and starting the process over, it had taken us three years to go through that. And um, as Mr. Lantos pointed out, we, we lose money every day that we operate that thing. And the, just the thought of, to us of starting this over was not palatable. The tribes are really desperate for some kind of funding. 
and they have limited resources. So the thought of their using any more of their limited resources to start this thing over was highly unpalatable. So that suggestion was dismissed in the first sentence. It didn't go anywhere beyond no. At that point, the tribes and the other people in the room, including me, started asking him questions about what was it that was so wrong in the application and why weren't the procedures followed and why was there no consultation and why, why, why? And after about the fourth or fifth why, I guess he really didn't want to listen to the whys anymore. He said it was that mea culpa, listen, we gave it to you. When it went upstairs, politics took over. Who so did you understand him to mean by we gave it to you? I understood him to mean uh, Mr. Hartman and him, the people who were in his office, the people who we understood to be the people who were working on this application. All of the other people involved, Mr. Anderson and the others, never even read the application. Did you question him at all as to what he meant by the political people or politics that turned you down? No, we had a pretty good idea of what he meant. Um, you were aware that he has said that he, in sworn testimony before the U.S. Senate, that, or, or in a deposition before the Senate, that he made this decision and that politics played no role in it. I am well aware of his statement. Um, but I know what he said to us also. How many people were witness to that conversation? Probably 20. Um, and all of them, you believe, would have a recollection close to yours that he said that we gave it to you, meaning line people within the Department of Interior and politics reversed it. I, I would say the majority of them would, would know that, that it was like the career people who were for this, it, but when it went beyond the career people. Your testimony says officials of the BIA, meaning that Mr. Scabine was not the only official with the BIA present when he made that statement. Correct. Can you, I know the chairman has asked you for the names of the individuals yes. present. Can you tell us the name of the other BIA or government officials who were present? Okay, if, if you, I, I believe one of them was Robin Yeager, but if you ask um, Chairman um, Ackley, I believe he, he might have a, a better hand on who those people are because I really wouldn't have known who they were. You know, I, I met them maybe once and maybe never before, but I, he, I think he could give you the names. Knowing the names of all, I mean, I think this is particularly significant. I think knowing the names of all of those individuals, including other BIA officials would be extremely important uh, for us. Let me, with the chairman's indulgence, one last question. Um, this has been under study by the Justice Department for more than 70 days. Uh, you have not been questioned by anyone at the Justice Department about this conversation? No, I have not. To your knowledge, has anyone else present in the room when this revelation occurred by Mr. Scabine been questioned by the Justice Department? I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't know. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we were not going to we're not going to second round. However, we are going to recognize Mr. Barrett briefly for a couple Just of one legislative moment, if comments. I, if I could, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I um, I want to concur with what what Mr. Kucinich said because I think if there's one thing that probably all the members of this panel agree on um, is that it, it probably wasn't appropriate for Duffy and Collier to leave Interior to work for the Shakopees, and I think that there um, I think there's a problem there uh, if you have someone who basically is going from from the Department of Interior directly to, to the tribe. I don't know if there are limitations because of, of Indian treaties as to limitations on that, but that's something that I would be interested in exploring as a committee. If not, I would, I would request the Department of Interior to look in that, and I know on the state level, um, at least in Wisconsin, this is the time when the gaming compacts are being renewed, and if we're going to have credibility in this issue in the future, I think that this is an is issue that has to be addressed. So I, we may not agree on everything, but I agree with you, and I agree with Mr. Kucinich that this is a problem. We will, uh, we will uh, ask uh, uh, Representative Young and Re Representative Pombo, the chairman of the Committee and Subcommittee on Interior, to uh, look into this, and I'm sure that they will. Uh, Mr. Havnick, I want to uh, thank you very much. You've been a good witness, and you've been very patient, and uh, you've acquitted yourself well, and we thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh,
we now invite uh, Ms. Birogel and uh, Ms. Berg uh, to come forward and uh, be sworn. Uh, as I understand it, uh, Ms. Birogel uh, represents the, the people who oppose the facility in, uh, in Hudson. And uh, Ms. Berg is a resident and, and uh, president of the Sandra Berg Communications, and that's a company located in Hudson, Wisconsin. Would you both uh, stand to be sworn? I don't, know, I don't know who that is in the middle, but do you, would you like to be sworn as well? <laughs> you asked him before. <laughs> okay. okay. You want to put your, your documents down? There? Um, no, I wasn't informed. Could you uh, speak in the mic because we can't hear you? I wasn't informed that this is going to be um, a dual thing. We are obviously on opposite sides. I don't think you would have Mr. Havernick and Mr. Babbitt sitting at the same table. Can I ask how this is going to be conducted in terms of questioning? Well, um, what we will I, do is we will... One at a time? No. What we will do is we will allow you to make an opening statement. We'll allow Ms. Berg to make an opening statement. And then the members of the committee may question whomever they like. I don't think the questioning is going to be of long duration. The main part of your testimony will be your opening statement. I don't think you're going to have to endure too much in the area of questioning. That's my view. Mr. Chairman, before you swear them in, just to answer this question that has been raised, we have been pressing to have you testify. The chairman agreed you could testify tomorrow. He told us at the beginning of this morning, the beginning of this hearing or early in this hearing, that you would be permitted to testify today. We were very appreciative of that. Just two seconds ago, the chairman informed me that he found somebody else to speak on the other side. I don't have any problem with that. I just think it's a little bit of a cruddy way to do business. But it's not unusual for, for, for congressional hearings to have two witnesses taking different points of view on the same panel. We've even encouraged that we have that so we could uh, have the witnesses uh, heard. I'd be happy to go afterwards and not sit up here while, uh, while now, I, I, What I'm saying is that uh, as far as I'm concerned, and you shouldn't well, be concerned about it, we ought to have both of you make your statements. We can ask questions of either one of you. Let me just say that uh, you were not here, Mr. Waxman. The minute I found out that Ms. Berg wanted to testify, I did talk to Mr. Barrett, and he'll attest to that fact. It was probably 45 minutes ago. If you were in attendance, you would have known, and you would have had time to raise your objection. Uh, would you oh, like Wait, 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 wait a minute. 45 minutes. We, we started at 10 o'clock. It's now almost 6 o'clock in the evening. I, I don't object to having two witnesses testify. You it have just a point of order. It just it seems to me that if you're going to give a courtesy, you ought to give a courtesy more than 45 minutes to any of the minority about witnesses you're going to have at a hearing. I'm not going to extend I do this not debate. have a point I'm of view. I'm not going to extend the debate. Other than order. to tell you, Mr. Waxman, I did not know about this myself until a short time ago, and I was trying to accord the same courtesy to Ms. Berg that we were according to the other person. That's all I was trying to Mr. do. Mr. Chairman. Now, would you gentlemen or would ladies like to be sworn? You're only the chairman. You should have informed you earlier. You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll be gone. I do. Ms. Berogel, uh, if you'd like, uh, we'll be glad to uh, start with you. You're, uh, you have five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. My name is Nancy Berogel. I've been a resident of the, Hudson, of, of the community of Hudson, Wisconsin for over 20 years. I'm the mother of two teenage sons, John and David, and wife of Robert. I am also the CEO of a small beverage business called Christian Regal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for having me testify. For weeks, we have been reading stories in major newspapers about the scandals surrounding the decision to deny an application to take land in the city of Hudson and put it into trust land for the purpose of opening an Indian casino. The process that is being examined and the claim that the decision was tainted greatly concerns the people of Hudson, Wisconsin. We hired no high-powered lobbyists we had no connections. We were our own lobbyists. And despite the intense efforts of the tribes and their lobbyists, we believed that this was a case where government truly worked. That a very good policy of not cramming a casino down the throat of a community who opposes it was in part the result of intense opposition from the Hudson community. We were very much a part of the process by which this decision was made, as we, like the other parties involved who will be affected by the outcome of this decision, 
were allowed to comment and give our input. Yet in both the Senate and almost the House committee hearings, our role has been completely ignored or glossed over. We believe this has happened because we don't fit in with the scandal theory. The local opposition was not partisan. It was not anti-Indian. There is not an Indian reservation in Hudson or St. Croix County. The local opposition was about not wanting casino gambling in our small city. The opposition includes a vast majority of the people of the Hudson community, and it cuts across all political parties and income levels. The local opposition was the basis for the denial of the casino application, and we are here to tell Congress that these reasons are valid. You see, we believe the casino interests have switched the issues. The real David versus Goliath story is not poor tribes versus rich tribes, but the small community of Hudson versus the Florida-based gambling enterprise. This battle began nearly 10 years ago when the Florida-controlled dog track was forced upon our community. The in fact, the tact of switching the issues has been raised before. In the 1992 casino referendum, Croyland poured over $12,000 into a marketing scheme that told people in the city of Hudson to vote yes for lower taxes. Nowhere did you see the word casino on their hundreds of yard signs. Their ads read, if you own a $100,000 home, it's $900 in your pocket. The savings they guaranteed in property tax savings. In fact, they guaranteed $5 million to the county, city, and schools. The truth is that the 1992 referendum was not even the same casino proposal that, was being, that is being debated. That didn't exist at that time. That casino proposal was with a different Indian tribe, the St. Croix Chippewa, which is the closest tribe to the city of Hudson. The 1992 referendum was a loss for the casino proponents when you combine the votes of the city of Hudson and the town of Troy. Why should the town of Troy be considered? Because the town of Troy is part of the Hudson community. The people who live in Troy have a Hudson address. They have a Hudson telephone exchange and they bring their children to Hudson schools to which they pay thousands of tax dollars. They have no shops or gas stations. Land was annexed from Troy for the purpose of building the dog track and up until recently bordered the track on three sides. Who recruited who? Did the tribes approach the failing dog track or did the failing dog track recruit the tribes? Was this an act of benevolence or was it driven by the self-serving need to bail the dog track out of nearly $40 million of debt? Another truth is that the agreement for government services was never an endorsement of having a casino in the Hudson area. Our elected officials had been told that the land could be put into trust and that the community could get no compensation for the lost property tax dollars. This agreement was negotiated under the condition that the merits of a possible casino were not to be discussed. All such discussion would be ruled out of order. This agreement was an insurance policy. It was only enforceable if the land went into trust. In 1993, the statewide gambling referenda, which is the most recent reflection of voter sentiment, 70% of the Hudson area voted to restrict casino gambling in the state of Wisconsin by means of a constitutional amendment. In 1994, long before the BIA's announcement, of which Mr. Havernick testified there was little opposition, <clears throat> a petition of over 3,100 signatures of Hudson area residents. This isn't divided up, but this, this is ju just the Hudson School District. And there were hundreds more that we could have obtained. This was presented to Governor Tommy Thompson, opposing the current, the current casino proposal. A copy of this petition was also presented to the BIA regional office in Minneapolis. In 1994, the town board of Troy passed a resolution opposing casino gambling and declared it would be detrimental to their community. The vote was unanimous, six to zero. In 1995, the Common Council of the City of Hudson passed a resolution opposing the casino four to two. And in 1995, many major businesses sponsored a full page ad, which was an open letter to Secretary Babbitt, Governor Thompson, and Mayor Bro, opposing the casino and stating that it would be detrimental to our community. Who is the best judge of detriment? 
Shouldn't the owners of businesses be in the best position to determine what is harmful to their business? Shouldn't the people who live in these communities? In 1995, Congressman Steve Gunderson, Senator Russ Feingold, and Representative to the Wisconsin Assembly, Sheila Harsdorf, our representative, with 28 other Wisconsin legislators sent a letter to Secretary Babbitt opposing the Hudson Casino application. All of the above information was submitted to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. How do we know? Because we sent it. We were part of the process. We sent letters and made phone calls, and we received letters and phone calls. But no one from the majority side of the committee ever bothered to check with us. This decision to, not, to deny the casino application because of the objections of the people, or sa it said the objections of the people of Hudson counted. If this decision stands untarnished, it will protect all the other Hudsons in the United States of America. Make no mistake, the gambling industry is looking for Hudsons. If this decision falls, and I might add for political reasons, then no community is safe. This decision has relevance to the entire country Hudson could be any small city. Had the Department of the Interior approved the application, a national precedent would have been set. Off-reservation casinos could then be forced upon other communities over the objections of their elected officials, and the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act would truly fail to protect. We have brought Hudson to Washington because we are part of the process that has been ignored. We applaud the Department of the Interior for respecting the community of Hudson and denying the casino application for the right reasons. The right reasons are facts, and we are here to tell them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Berg, you're recognized. Um, I, too, thought I was coming to observe, so I don't have an opening statement. And I, and I wonder if you would let me just speak extemporaneously? I'd like to draw your attention to the very nice display that the opposition has put together for you. And everything on that display is truthful. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is what is not on that display. Starting from uh, the left, the city of Hudson opposes the casino. That is, uh, a ref that is a resolution from our city council. The vote was four to two. It was not unanimous. There are three government entities that are party to that agreement, uh, along with the city council, the uh, county board, and the school district are also equal partners in that, in that um, agreement. And those entities have chosen to stay out of this fight and to remain neutral. The town of Troy opposes the casino. That is absolutely true. They have also opposed the uh, joint library agreement. They opposed the, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of contention with our fire protection agreements. The town of Troy and the city of Hudson don't get along. That's the truth. And when Nancy said that they uh, belong to the Hudson School District, they have Hudson addresses, they have Hudson telephone numbers, some of them do. A lot of them, about half of them, have River Falls addresses, they have River Falls phone numbers, and they go to the River Falls School District. Um, that, that, that township stretches from uh, the north to the south about 13 miles. So those people are not uh, in our community. Um, going on to the Wisconsin, Hudson. Wisconsin and Hudson say no to the expansion of gambling. That's absolutely true. And in that statewide referendum, I voted against gambling. Because along with a lot of the people here, I'm not sure it's the right thing. But you know what? It's the law of the land, and you people did it. Um, majority businesses, major businesses oppose casino. There are, I think, about 25 or 30 businesses there. And that represents, I don't know what percentage you guys do the math, but there are between 300 and 400 businesses in Hudson. So you tell me if that's an overwhelming majority. Um, Republicans and Democrat officials oppose uh, the casino. There is only one Democrat up there, so you can erase that S. You've talked at length about Tommy Thompson and his position, whatever it is. We have two United States senators. The other one is not represented up there. 
Steve Gunderson is a very dear and close friend of mine, and I love him dearly, and we differ on this issue. But you know what? He's not our congressman anymore, and our congressman doesn't have a position up there, does he? Sheila Harsdorf, our representative in the state legislature, there are, I'll take Nancy's word for it, 30 signatures on that letter. That's representative of 101 legislators, not overwhelming opposition, Mr. Waxman. Um, so you have four legislators up there. We have a lot more. You don't see our state senator up there. She hasn't taken a position. You have lovely pictures of very good people, my neighbors in Hudson. There are, I counted, about 100 pictures, Nancy? 100? Okay, about 100 families up there. In the Congress, we don't refer to people by their first names, even if you know each other. So please Mrs. call her. Mrs. Virago. I've <laughs> never called her Mrs. Virago in my life. I'm sorry. Well, I will do Mr. that. Mr. Waxman, when he has a comment, please address the chair for the point of order instead of the witnesses. I would afford him the same, uh, 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 same courtesy if he was chairing this meeting. And I will call her Mrs. Virago. Um, if I were to put up a display, I could put up that many pictures, too. Because the referendum that was held on a different uh, issue, absolutely, on a different agreement, but the people of Hudson were asked clearly, and they knew what they were voting on. Yes, we talked about taxes, because I'll bet every one of you in your campaign talk about taxes, because that's what people want to talk about. And we did talk about taxes. But everybody knew what they were voting on. They were voting on the sale of St. Croix Meadows to an Indian tribe, any Indian tribe, an Indian tribe, for the purposes of casino gaming. And that referendum passed. Not by much, but it passed. Not overwhelming opposition. I would also like to say that you need to hear from both sides. And I'm here because I am the other side. And you said a lot today about these people need to be heard. And they do. They're fine people. And I respect the right. I, matter of fact, I, I applaud their coming out here. But I came out here, too. And I didn't book in advance. And it cost me over $1,000. And I'm hoping I can get my plane out of here because I don't want to rebook. Do you yield back the balance of your time? Well, I can keep talking. I presume you do. Let me... Uh, let me just uh, start off. Uh, we're going to uh, go to the five-minute rule, I presume, rather than spend the 30 minutes on each side. Uh, you can turn the clock on for me and for our council here, if you will. Let me just say that uh, I appreciate both of your statements. I think everybody in the committee does. But the issue is not about gambling. It is not about gambling. What we have been talking about all day today is whether or not the system has been corrupted by illegal contributions and unethical or illegal political influence. I would say that most of the members up here, myself included, are not for legalized gambling. But the fact of the matter is, uh, it, 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 it is, it is an issue uh, before uh, under discussion today, but 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 the major issue that we're talking about is whether or not the Department of Interior was influenced by wealthy Indian tribes and their lobbyists who had connections with the White House, with the President, with the Vice President, and with the Secretary of the Interior. It really does not bear at all on whether or not we're for or against legalized gambling, or whether we're for or not for or against a dog track in Hudson, or whether we're for or against a gambling casino in Hudson. It has nothing to do with that. I would not have had the hearing if we were just talking about gambling. We're talking about illegal or possible illegal campaign contributions, and that has been the focus of our hearings from day one. We've, we've been looking at illegal or possibly illegal foreign contributions coming in from China, from the Middle East, from South America, from all over the place. And coupled with that, is illegal contributions that may have come from uh, Indian tribes to buy influence to stop a process that was legal and, and ethical and lawful. That's what this is all about. So I appreciate you and all your friends coming out from Hudson. It's very nice of you to be here. But I think you came out here uh, not understanding fully what this hearing's about. It's not about 
the Hudson dog track. It's not about the Hudson casino. It's about whether or not illegal campaign contributions bought influence that altered the process that was passed by law to the Congress of the United States. That's, that's what this is all about. Do any of my colleagues uh, wish uh, time on my side? I'll yield the balance of my time to Representative Snowbar. Uh, just real, real quickly, uh, to follow up on, on some of your comments, Mr. Chairman, uh, I was originally going to ask these as a question, but I, I don't feel like I ought to put you on the spot uh, to answer the questions. You're, you're welcome to if you, if you care to. And again, I, I want to point out that uh, I've, I've had to deal with these exact same issues at the state level in the state of Kansas and am not known back there as a fan of gambling or of IGRA either one. And if any of my colleagues care to, to take on IGRA and, and change that, I'm, I'm with you all the way. Let's, let's go about doing that. Um, I'm also very well aware of the tactics that are used by the gambling industry to uh, try to uh, assert this in, in states where we really didn't want it. And we've thus far been able to haul off casino gambling uh, at least for everyone except Indians. IGRA kind of took away that, that uh, option for us. Here, here's the question, I guess, that, that I've had to ask myself, and very frankly, I don't care to overturn this decision. I'd just soon see it stand. I like the decision. How does everybody else feel about it? I don't like the process by which the decision was made. And, and I think that's, that's the key question for this committee. And, and here's the question I ask myself. And that is, if it's found out that this decision was based or heavily influenced by campaign contributions, do I support that process? And the answer was, no, I don't. Whereas I am very, very supportive of the end. I'm not supportive of the means. And I don't live my life by a philosophy that the ends justify the means. Uh, I wish you well in your fight against this. Again, I'm not looking for this decision to be overturned in any way, shape, or form. If that happens through the court process uh, and you need assistance in, in fighting it back through the other way, again, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to come up and help because, again, I don't, uh, I don't like gambling and I don't like uh, the way IGRA has imposed that on the states. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's, it's very obvious to us that uh, the proponents for the casino would not have taken it to this level if they didn't have hopes of overturning that decision. And so we just wanted to be very clear that if this had been approved, it would have set a national precedent, as Steve Gunderson, our congressman at the time, stated. But let me just say that nobody brought it to this level, ma'am. I called the hearing as chairman to investigate illegal contributions. The proponents of the, of the gambling casino or the opponents had nothing to do with this hearing. We called this hearing strictly because we wanted to find out if illegal campaign contributions were influencing political decisions or decisions made at the Department of Indi Interior. That's who called the hearing, the chairman of this committee, myself. It had nothing whatsoever to do with whether the proponents or the opponents uh, uh, were for this, uh, this, this, this project. Did you want to make one final comment before I uh, yield to my colleague? I would. I would. I, I really feel that the whole issue here is the issue of fairness and the fairness of the process. And there are some of us out there that really believe that our government should be fair. And if, if there is a casino in Hudson or if there is not a casino in Hudson, it stands not to change my life one iota. But let me tell you, if my government cannot be counted on to be fair to all of its citizens and to follow its own regulations, then I think we all lose. I thank you. I yield now to my colleague from California, Mr. Wexler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The contributions from Indian tribes, whether they were to Democrats or Republicans, have not been called into question as illegal, as the Chairman has indicated. He thought they were illegal. They're not illegal. The question is whether the decision by the Department of Interior was influenced uh, and therefore improper because they received campaign contributions from those for whom they ruled. Now, you cannot question and evaluate the Department of Interior's decision without some examination of the merits. It's just impossible to do it. The Department of Interior had a decision to make, and they looked at the merits. And it's interesting to see most of the members of this committee 
thinking that the decision that was made was the proper one on the merits. So they may well have made the decision on the merits for all the right reasons. There are some people who argued they should have made the decision the other way. Well, that argument didn't prevail. Uh, Ms. Berogel, what you had to say was very, very important. It's not irrelevant what the community thinks about this issue. And you and your colleagues have come all the way at your own expense to give us this view. We're entitled to be heard. My regret is that this is now 6 o'clock in the evening and a hearing that started at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's no press that I can identify in the audience. Uh, well, there are some, but, uh, but most, of the press, <laughs> most of the press has left. I don't know how many people are going to be watching this on television after such a long day. What you had to say was completely relevant and important to this hearing, and that's what the witnesses that start off the hearing had to say. They wanted to tell us why, as a poor Indian tribe, the decision should have gone their way on the merits as they, see, as they saw it. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, 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 unimportant what you had to say here, and you should have been given a, uh, an opportunity to speak earlier. Uh, Ms. Berg, uh, usually we, we're informed of witnesses in advance. I was informed seconds before you came before us, so I don't know much about you. Uh, were you a member of the city council? Yes, I was. And did you lose your re-election over yes, this I issue? Yes, I did. I also ran for the state senate in 1988 and lost that election. And, and, and uh, was an issue in your campaigns uh, that you supported the uh, Huge casino? issue. Matter of fact, in that election, there, was, there were two dog tracks um, being talked about, one in the township of Hudson and one in the city of Hudson. And all of the incumbents who um, supported the dog track were not reelected. It was definitely why I was not reelected. But now let me go on, well, please. No, me, no, 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 no. Excuse me. This is my time, and I only have okay. a limited amount. But let me tell the whole story, please. Uh, well, we'll see if you mm -hmm. get a chance to do it. I hope you do. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you ran for office on this issue in law, so the people expressed their view on it. But okay. you've been presented to us as uh, Sandra Berg from Sandra Berg Communications. Who do you represent in the Sandra Berg Communications? Me. Do you re have you had any... Uh, contractual re re uh, relationship with Mr. Havenick or the uh, casino? Yes, I have. Um, in the early part of uh, the 1990s, right around the time that the dog track was open, and during the um, period of the referendum in Hudson, I did work for Mr. Havenick. And my job specifically was to make sure that that organization followed all of the campaign laws in the state of Wisconsin. That was my job. Work for him and I, pa I was paid for it. And I worked for him. And I made sure that Excuse the twelve thousand dollars that I have to ask the questions and mm -hmm. you have to ask answer them. I'll it's be happy not to the opportunity just to go on at random. Okay. Because we only have a limited time. Yes, you the answer is yes. Now. You do work for him now? No. Well listen to the question. You'll give okay. the wrong answer. I said no. Okay. Have, has your uh, you say a thousand dollar trip, who paid for this trip? I did. American Express did and they'll be reimbursed in and about why, thirty days. What, what uh, motivated you to come here today? At, at an expense of maybe $1,000 to, to hear this testimony? Because there was a reporter that came to my house to interview me that told me that uh, seven or eight people were going to be here from the opposition. And uh, I called Mr. Bruns, who was a, a former city council member who resigned last June, um, and asked him if he'd like to come out and observe. I, I really thought we were just going to observe. So you are here simply to observe. You are not in any, any economic uh, relationship with anybody that has an interest in this casino. Not at this at time, but I was. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I see my yellow light is on, and, and that just means that my time is, is, is up. Let me thank uh, you for your testimony, and I want to yield to Mr. I Kerr. just want to disagree strongly with um, Mr. Waxman. Um, I think the journals who are here are fine journalists. Excellent journal, some of the best <laughs> on Capitol Hill. And the spelling of my last name is B-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. <laughs> my apologies to the journalists who are the gentleman uh, here today. And I will yield to uh, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, in the seconds that remain, yes, I think uh, that we're here to determine whether there were plausible reasons why the application for the casino in Hudson should have been rejected. The testimony that's been given here suggests that there were, there was widespread community opposition. Uh, all over this country, Mr. Chairman, we have people who are protesting things that could damage their community, rezonings, the location of uh, dr uh, chain drugstores in residential areas, cellular towers, nuclear waste uh, being dumped in their communities. 
uh, eminent domain for highways and widening of roads. And if there's one place in the country, Hudson, that won a victory, then there ought to be people cheering all over this country for that one place. And you're to be congratulated. Your appearance here was not in vain. You're an inspiration to people around the country that they can fight the system and win. Let me uh, just uh, say that I, I, I think it's uh, laudable that the people do stand up against things that they don't want in their community uh, and are successful. But once again, I want to state that the purpose of this hearing is to find out whether or not the law was broken by illegal campaign contributions or campaign contributions being given to influence political decisions. And if that did occur, and that's what we're after, to find out if that did occur, then people broke the law, and if they broke the law, they should be held accountable. The hearings, I know that uh, the opposition today has tried to make this a referendum on whether or not there should be a gambling casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. The fact of the matter is that is not is at, what is at issue before this committee. It's whether or not illegal campaign activity took place, illegal contrib or contributions were made that influenced decisions made by the Department of the Interior. And if that was the case, then those who broke the law must be held accountable. Does anyone else seek five minutes? Mr. Shattig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I endeavor not to use my full uh, five minutes. I want to thank you both for being here. I appreciate uh, your energy and effort uh, taking the time to come here and express yourselves. Um, I want to make some points very clear. I want to begin by saying that I violently disagree with my friend, Mr. Kucinich. This is not about whether there were plausible reasons for the department to turn down the license. That is not what this hearing is about. This hearing is not about whether casino gambling is good or bad. It is not whether Indian gambling is good or bad. It is not about whether casino gambling for Hudson, Wisconsin would have been good or bad. This hearing is precisely about whether or not we are a nation of laws and we follow those laws and they are applied equally to all citizens regardless of their power or their political influence, or whether we are not a nation of laws, whether we are a nation of political influence, where we write a series of laws and lay out procedures where people can be treated equally before the law, equally before the lady of justice who has a blindfold on, or, or, or in fact, they are not treated equally because some have money, and some have power, and some have influence, and some have aggressive lobbyists who will not give up. And this is an inquiry into whether corruption went to the highest levels of this government. And it is not about gambling. I happen to be a vehement opponent of Indian gaming. I have worked in Arizona with gaming and non-gaming interests, with Indians and non-Indians. And I will tell you that I think IGRA is a grave mistake for this nation. I think we are creating a huge dependency within America's Native Americans on gambling and its proceeds. We are not giving them legitimate economic development, which we should be doing. We are not giving them free enterprise zones, which we should be doing. We are not giving them tax breaks so they can build long-term legitimate businesses that do not bring crime. Instead, having breached our obligation to America's Native Americans for generations, we suddenly say, let's solve it by giving them gambling. And if they get some crime, or if it hurts their kids, or if, it, or if it brings corruption into their communities, too bad they'll at least have money. Now, I personally have fought gaming, Indian gaming in Arizona, not because I don't care about Native Americans, but because I believe it's wrong and will do severe damage. I personally led the fight against a ballot initiative in my county to expand Indian gaming in the last election. Um, and I put my own personal money into that effort, and I re recruited money and, and solicited money from others. This isn't about Indian gaming. What it is about is whether or not we are a nation of laws and we abide by those laws and whether those laws were ignored in this case. And I think there's been some shocking testimony today to suggest that at least someone is not telling the truth in this story. And I think we need to get to the bottom of it. Now, with regard to you, Mrs. Barager, is that right? Barager. Barager. I, I apologize. I'm trying to pronounce it correctly. I'm with you all the way. Um, I think Hudson should not have gaming if you as a community don't want it. Um, and I will come there and help you fight it, because I don't like it. 
But that doesn't mean I agree with the decision of the Department of Interior, and I certainly don't agree with it if it was made on the basis of something other than the merits under the law. And I simply want to conclude by pointing out to you that while I think IGRA is a mistake and it has serious problems, which are being bringing about uh, the detriment of this nation, a lot of gambling, a lot of corruption, and you see the power and money and influence in this particular case, there is one piece of IGRA which is worthwhile and which I call to your attention. The particular section here that requires the Secretary to decide whether to grant um, trust status says that if the, there is a determination that the gaming establishment on newly acquired lands would be, one, in the best interests of the Indian tribes and its members, and two, would not be detrimental to the surrounding community, the Secretary may approve it, and then here's the key for those of you in Hudson who oppose the expansion of Indian gaming in your community. But only if the governor of the state in which the gaming activity is to be conducted concurs in the Secretary's determination. What that means is that what happens in this hearing about a totally different issue, whether or not corruption occurred, isn't the question. The question is, will Governor Thompson turn this down if it's ultimately done? And the last point I want to make, there was some significance that tried to be made out of this issue of a similar license being turned down where a tribe from Iowa wanted to come into, no, I'm sorry, a tribe from Nebraska wanted to come into Iowa and set up a gaming uh, operation, and the governor of Iowa said, no, I'm not going to grant permission for an Iowa Indian tribe to come in and conduct gaming, excuse me, a, Nevada, a Nebraska Indian tribe to come into Iowa and conduct gaming to the detriment of Nebraska Indians. I don't see a parallel at all, uh, and I thank you for being here. May I respond? Certainly. Thank you. First of all, I think we agree on almost everything, almost everything, especially I liked what you had to say about detriment, about the detriment that gambling is bringing to this whole country. And that's how we see it in the community of Hudson. Secondly, I would like to ask you, do you agree with the policy that has been professed in the Department of the Interior that they should not cram it down a community's throat if the elected officials representing that community vote against it. Which is precisely, yes ma'am I do, and which is precisely why IGRA is written to say the governor has the ability to turn it down. Yes ma'am. And can I also comment on the governor? There was one uh, quote that n nobody ever mentioned uh, from Governor Thompson, and uh, oh, right here, right in front of me. What? Um, he was debating his uh, Democrat opponent and they both agreed on the casino issue of Hudson. They both said they were opposed to it. The governor added, I would oppose the casino at the dog track and would use whatever power the governor's office had to block it. I have never heard any statements by the governor taking back that statement or saying anything to the contrary. In, uh, in regards to the discussion about the expansion of gambling, saying that, you know that they would drop some casinos and reduce the c number of casinos by three from 17 casinos in the state of Wisconsin to, I suppose that would mean 14. Um, it's like trading sand, bags of sand for bags of gold. And everybody with a brain sees that as an expansion of gambling. Um, also, uh, may, may I comment about anything else? <laughs> I, I mean, there was some really. I'm going to want some time we're, we're too. Trying, we're trying to uh, uh, give you as much latitude as okay. possible. The hour is late. If you could uh, uh, summarize uh, relatively quickly, we'd okay. Well, there's just a couple. Did, before we go any further, do no, no, any no, of my colleagues? Uh, I mean, okay. Uh, if you could make it uh, a brief statement on whatever subject you'd like. If you've waited all day. We'd appreciate it. Well, and there's same just thing for you, Ms. Burke. Thank you. Um, there's just a couple points. The county's position was neutral. It was not. It was never an endorsement. Uh, for the casino, and I have a, a letter written by the chairman of the county board saying that. Also, um, the city's position was neutral, and the, there needs to be an understanding that our officials were told they could end up with nothing with, if they didn't negotiate that agreement, and that was why the agreement was negotiated. It was never an endorsement of a casino. It was viewed as an insurance policy. That's all. I'd like to agree wholeheartedly 
that we're here to talk about the process. We're here to talk about a fair process and making sure that that process that you people laid out is done in a fair manner. And I was under the impression that the governor's approval or disapproval comes at the end of that process. And it seems to me that we've spent a lot of time here today trying to figure out what the end process is going to be. And I was of the opinion that the Department of Interior was supposed to make their determination independently. So I don't understand what difference it really makes what Tommy Thompson says, because Tommy Thompson, I would guess, because he's a fine governor, is going to make that decision based on the final product that comes out of the Department of Interior. Right? Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, if I could just conclude by saying I want to suggest to you, Mrs. Barager, that you don't want a system where the rich and the powerful win and the procedure isn't followed. We had no lobbyists. We hired no high-powered lobbyists. We were our lobbyists, and we were part of the process. People acting That's what's being ignored, ignored here. It's like it's just rich tribes no, versus no, poor tribes. No, it's not being ignored here at all. We this don't have any lobbyists about, except this us. This hearing isn't about gambling. It's about whether or not the process, the process. was corrupted. And there was massive lobbying on behalf of people who wanted to block this casino. And Maybe not by you, that. We but there was that. massive lobbying. And I don't think you want a process where the rich and the powerful win no, and the don't. law gets ignored. May I say, too, that the, the Patrick O'Connor letter <clears throat> that was faxed to City Hall was faxed to Mrs. B Birago. Now, she may not have paid for him, but this came from Lewis Taylor, tribal chairman, to Mrs. Birago. No, to, so to say that there was no, you know, large May I respond lobbying. to that? Well, I don't... No, uh, that what, really, well, that absolutely respond, requires I'll let, I'll let a you response. Res just a minute, I'll let you respond. You but I don't want you two ladies getting into a prolonged debate. Okay. So uh, you respond, and then I'm going to see if any of my other okay. colleagues have any final comments. As the organizer of the petition here that we brought a copy of to show you, um, and also I was part of the business group that opposed it, which represents many very large businesses. Um, I had an idea because we were so surprised that the BIA and the regional office recommended it. In fact, the governor must have been surprised too because he told us in a meeting he didn't think it would go any further. He thought it would be, you know, shot down in Minneapolis. So um, I had an idea that I would get a delegation of many people that represented all of the groups that opposed this casino proposal together, and that we would all come to the BIA and sit down and tell them all the different reasons that we were opposed to this casino application. And so we knew that the tribes were opposed. We had no contact with them whatsoever. So I called Lewis Taylor and uh, made the suggestion. I talked to him maybe three times, and he sent me a fax um, about the, the letter, the, the meeting with Dan Fowler. We're mostly Republicans, so we didn't go. He then called me, I don't know, it, was, it was, must have been when this letter was sent, and he said he had a letter that he wanted to send me a copy of. And I said, um, Fine, do you, have, do you still have the fax number from when you sent me that one other fax? And he said, yes. His secretary faxed it to City Hall by mistake. No one ever even told me. It was when a reporter called me and said, what's going on? How come you're getting faxes to you at City Hall from an Indian chief? And I said, what are you talking about? So he came over to my house. That was the first time I saw the letter. And if I might add, it was such a screwy letter, and it had so many inaccurate facts in it that I thought it was just ridiculous. And I thought, who would take this seriously? And I didn't even save my copy. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe maybe it. Maybe President Clinton took it seriously. <coughs> did, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Did, did, okay. Does uh, Mr. Barrett, you have some more I've comments? Got, if I could have five minutes, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Barrett, you recognize. Thank you very much. And I know the hour is late. Um, the chairman said that, that really, your being here today is, is a little misplaced because that's not the issue. The issue is, is that, well, I, I apologize, but the inference that I drew was that that your attendance was not necessary for these hearings. But obviously now you're, you're here, so I don't I apologize to the chairman if I put words in his mouth. But, but I'm looking at the, at the denial letter from the Department of the Interior, 
And the first issue or the first ground that is laid out for denying this um, is the opposition from the community. Uh, and I'm reading from the letter. The record before us indicates that the surrounding communities are strongly opposed to this proposed off-reservation trust acquisition. Acquisition, it goes through some of the, the, the actions that we've talked about today, Common Council, State Legislators, Town of Troy. The paragraph ends, because of our concerns over detrimental effects on the surrounding community, we are not in a position on this record to substitute our judgment for that of local communi communities directly impacted by this proposed off-reservation gaming, gaming acquisition. I don't know if this is the first time the Department of Interior ever used this. I don't know if it was inappropriate for them to use this, but they used it. We and, think it's the right thing to and do. I, I understand, and I agree with that. Let me, let me continue mm -hmm. if I could. I think what we have here today, though, um, is we have a hearing that's obviously very, very critical um, of the decision that was made. Um, the first panel were the aggrieved tribes, the, the tribes that lost. Um, I understand why they lost and why they, maybe I don't understand why they lost, given their statements, but they lost, and I understand why they're upset. Um, our second panelist was the gentleman who had the controlling interest in the dog track. He lost. He was not happy. Um, so our, our, until you testified, our whole first day, our people who lost in this. And frankly, um, I think that had the decision gone the other way, we could have had a wonderful hearing in the other direction. Uh, and I wouldn't put it past the majority in Congress to have held the hearing in the other direction and to drag Mr. Eckstein in here and rake them over the coals for being a close associate of Bruce Babbitt. Um, Mr. Havnick said, said that they, they had hoped to get access by hiring Mr. Havnick, I mean, by hiring Mr. Eckstein. Um, you, you've got people involved on both sides that have close ties at the national level to the Democrats because the president's in control. Um, let's look at the state level. At the state level, we've heard a lot of testimony today uh, about how much money was given to Governor Thompson. Uh, I have no reason to disagree with Mr. Havnick's reasons for giving money to Governor Thompson. $13,000, $13,500 on one day from he and his wife and his mother-in-law, that's his right. Um, but my guess is that, the, that Mr. Havnick probably gives money to legislators who support dog tracks. I don't have any problem with that. I don't support them, I don't get any money, that's fine. That's life in the big city. Uh, but I don't impugn his integrity for doing that. And what we have here is we have people who have lost who are impugning the integrity of the people who won. And again, if it had gone the other way, I'll tell you what you would have seen. You would have seen Mr. Havnick being raked over the coals for giving all this money to Governor Thompson from, from the tribes that lost. And the whole point of this is you get involved in gaming, you get involved in the government of the United States or a state government deciding economic issues. You're buying yourself a can of worms that you're just going to regret forever. Because once the government decides who should win in the marketplace, and that's what this is, the government is deciding who's going to win in the marketplace. You're going to have winners and you're going to have losers. And here you had big guns on both sides. You had big guns representing the tribes that won. You had big guns representing the tribes that lost. And when you got big guns firing at each other, someone's going to get shot. And that's what happened here. Um, I, my opposition to gambling has been precisely because of some of these issues. I think there is so much money around. It just clouds people's judgment. Uh, and I think people that may have been opposed to it all of a sudden are in favor of it, um, and that's fine. But, but I don't think that we should leave today without recognizing a couple things. Um, one, this was a messy situation, um, and I think that Mr. Babbitt probably made some comments that he regrets. If my best friend in my whole life came into me and asked me to do something, um, I'd probably fudge a little answer as to why I wasn't doing it, um, and I think that's what he did, but that's what happened. So I, I want to thank you both for coming. Uh, I think that your testimony has been well received, and I want to thank the other witnesses for being here today, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to go back to uh, uh, this point that Mr. Barrett started to pursue and continue. There are uh, two tests which the Department of Interior must follow with respect to the um, Indian Gaming uh, Regulatory Act. Uh, one test is whether or not the uh, deal or arrangement would be good uh, and beneficial to the Indian partners. 
and the other test is uh, the uh, local opposition or how local communities feel about it. The information which has been presented today uh, indicates that uh, there is a dispute over both of those parts. But the hearing uh, has shown conclusively that it is that it's plausible that the law was applied correctly by the Department of Interior. It's not a far out notion. Had they approved or disapproved of the application and there was no community opposition and the Indian partners were themselves complaining about the deal, uh, that would have been very interesting. But they had particular concern about the benefits to the Indian partners, and they also, according to records, were able to see a demonstrated community opposition, as has been testified today. Now, I will state again, Mr. Chairman, that if uh, money was used to influence the decision-making process, whether the outcome was favorable or not, uh, that's reprehensible, and I think everyone on this committee would, would agree. <clears throat> but we have had no proof presented to us today of illegal campaign contributions. We have had no proof presented today that decisions were made based on those contributions. We have heard charges, yes, we have heard allegations, that's right. Uh, some of us have suspicions about it, it's yes. But proof? No. This committee is about gathering information to be able to make an assessment as to whether or not laws have been broken. If we are going to be consistent with the American system of justice, we have to reach our conclusions based on the evidence, not on wishful thinking of partisans, but on the evidence. And I'm still waiting for the evidence to be brought forward. And Mr. Chairman, if we bring it forward, I will vote with you for the purposes of recommending any action that need to, needs to be taken. But I haven't seen that yet. I do want to say, though, that I think that it is useful that the chairman holds these hearings. I know I have a difference of opinion with some of my colleagues on this side of the aisle about that. But it is useful that you hold these hearings because it's still possible that from these hearings we may find a way to change this system. Thank you. As we uh, conclude, uh, let me just say uh, that some of the facts that we have found today, and these are facts, the law requires consultation with tribes that make application if they are going to have that application declined. That law was not followed. Rather, the rich tribes that are making $400,000 for each man, woman, and child had a meeting with the Department of Interior along with their lobbyists. One of the lobbyists was Mr. O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor uh, is a former uh, executive with the De Democrat National Committee who had met with the president in Minnesota. Uh, subsequent to that, a call was made from Air Force One to Mr. Ickes, who was asked to look into the problem with the Department of Interior. Uh, these are facts that came out today. Uh, lobbyists were hired, Mr. O'Connor and others, to uh, stop the progress or process uh, that was taking place at the Department of Interior. Uh, after the application was rejected, even though it had been approved at the lower levels, $350,000 in contributions were made to the Democrat National Committee. After that, that's a fact, after that, Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier one of which was a chief counsel to the Department of Interior, one of whom was a chief of staff at the Department of Interior, chief of staff to Mr. Babbitt, left the Interior Department and went to work for the very wealthy tribe, uh, the Shakopees, uh, making uh, quite a bit of money. 
subsequent to that, Mr. Collier, who was one of the people who were involved in the decision making in this particular case, carried a $50,000 to $100,000 check to the DNC on behalf of this wealthy tribe, the Shakopees. Now, you may not consider those facts worthy of consideration. Uh, I do. I think those are things that we ought to uh, bear in mind as we continue our hearings. I believe more facts will come out uh, in the days to come. And with that, let me just thank the witnesses for being here and say that this committee stands in recess till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good job, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Bureau. Go. You know what? <laughs> you and I are only having a friend. Oh, listen, Carol. You know, you know what? Friend. Excuse me. I would have had a cup of coffee for a long time ago. A lawsuit? Well, for Pete's sake. I'm not going to sue you. you. I need both you ladies to fill out these I'm cards. I need. I am not. such a cheap shot on the beverage thing. Do you remember you called me and said, could you bring me down to the for Christian Regal? You were having that, that open house for well, some people from the that track. That was the dog track. That was I know. That was a cheap this morning, we'll continue with our live coverage of the House Committee hearings on campaign fundraising, chaired by Representative Dan Burton of Indiana. Witnesses will include representatives from the Indian Gaming Management staff.